Bu sekalian, salam sejahtera seluruh sivitas akademika Fakultas Hukum UPH. Puji syukur kepada Tuhan yang Maha Esa. Fakultas Recording in progress. Tahun ke-25. Kami mengharapkan dapat mengamalkan perlaku adil dan cinta kesetiaan dan rendah hati. Ini adalah sesuai dengan tema Disnatalis Fakultas Hukum UPH. Dan terakhir, saya ingin mengucapkan selamat mengikuti segala acara Disnatalis Fakultas Hukum UPH. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Saya Haji Andika Zerumi, Wakil Gubernur Provinsi Banten, mengucapkan selamat memperingati Disnatalis ke-25 Fakultas Hukum Universitas Belita Harapan. Saya berharap seluruh sivitas akademika Fakultas Hukum Universitas Belita Harapan dapat terus mengedepankan kolaborasi dengan pemerintah daerah, khususnya dalam pembangunan guna meningkatkan daya saing daerah. Perguruan tinggi sebagai garda terdepan dalam mencerdaskan kehidupan masyarakat, pemerintah Provinsi Banten tentunya berharap ada kerjasama dengan perguruan tinggi dan juga sektor industri yang dikenal dengan istilah triple helix. Ini dapat senantiasa terus kita tingkatkan. Jalinan triple helix terbukti menjadi kunci pertumbuhan ekonomi dan inovasi melalui pengimplementasian intelektualisme dan kreativitas mahasiswa dalam kehidupan bermasyarakat. Semoga Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan terus senantiasa membangun intelektualisme dan kreativitas mahasiswa dan juga sivitas kampus sebagai wujud kontribusi UPH dalam pembangunan daerah. Dirgahayu Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan. Demikian terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. yang sebesar-besarnya kepada Bapak Dekan Fakultas Hukum, Bapak Profesor Bintang Saragi, dan Panitia Dias Nantales Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan yang telah memberikan kesempatan kepada keluarga kami untuk ambil bagian dalam acara Dias Nantales ini. Saya, Melani Kumarga, mewakili keluarga besar, keluarga Profesor Dr. Daniel Kumarga SMH, mengucapkan selamat dan profisial untuk Dies Natalis Fakultas Hukum yang ke-25. Semoga tetap sukses dan menjadi Fakultas Hukum yang membanggakan. Kami ikut bangga dengan prestasi. Bagi Universitas Pilihan Mahasiswa, baik dalam dan luar kota. Tentunya ayah saya selaku salah satu pendiri Universitas Kita Harapan pada tahun 1994 yang diminta langsung oleh Dr. Mokhariyadi untuk mewujudkan impian beliau menjadikan Universitas Kita Harapan sebagai universitas yang bertaraf internasional, turut bangga dengan penerus beliau yang menjadikan Fakultas Hukum Universitas Kita Harapan menjadi universitas andalan. Sekali lagi, izinkan kami menyampaikan selamat atas Dies Natalis Universitas Kita Harapan yang ke-25 dengan pencapaian prestasi Fakultas Hukum, sukses selalu Tuhan memberkati. Kami, keluarga besar Fakultas Hukum Tak Surabaya, mengucapkan selamat ulang tahun yang ke-25 Universitas Lita Harapan. Semoga dalam usia yang ke-25 ini, Universitas Lita Harapan semakin maju, dan semakin meningkatkan kualitas sumber daya manusia yang dihasilkan untuk ikut serta berpartisipasi dalam membangun negara kesehatan Republik Indonesia demi kemajuan bangsa dan negara dan mewujudkan keadilan bagi seluruh rakyat Indonesia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya Profesor Dr. Farida Katiti Nyesaing Hong, Dekan Fakultas Hukum Universitas Hasanuddin sekaligus selaku Ketua Badan Kerjasama Dekan Fakultas Hukum Perguruan Tinggi Negeri Se-Indonesia menyampaikan selamat dan sukses 
Dies Natalis ke-25 Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan. Semoga peringatan Dies Natalis ini menjadi momentum dalam melakukan kelas balik akan hadirnya institusi pendidikan tinggi hukum yang sejak awal diikhtiarkan untuk melahirkan lulusan yang menjunjung tinggi keadilan serta cinta kebaikan dan tetap berjalan dengan rendah hati. Selamat dan sukses. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Saya Muhammad, Ketua Dewan Kehormatan Penyelenggara Pemilu Republik Indonesia. Dengan gembira menyampaikan selamat Dies Natalis ke-25 Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan. Saya sangat percaya di usia yang semakin matang, Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan semakin mampu menghadirkan kajian-kajian ilmu pengetahuan disiplin ilmu hukum yang tentunya sangat dibutuhkan bagi para penstabil ilmu hukum. Sesuai temanya tahun ini, semoga Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan semakin mampu menghadirkan nilai-nilai keadilan, kemanusiaan dan ketulusan dalam mengemban peran-peran ilmu pengetahuan. Sekali lagi selamat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Om Swastiastu. Namo Buddhaya dan salam kebajikan. Saya Titi Nurbaiti, Dekan Fakultas Hukum Universitas Trisakti. Beserta keluarga besar Fakultas Hukum Universitas Trisakti mengucapkan selamat Dies Natalis ke-25 bagi Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan. Semoga Fakultas Hukum Pelita Harapan semakin jaya dan dapat memberikan kontribusi yang nyata bagi perkembangan pendidikan tinggi di Indonesia khususnya pendidikan tinggi hukum untuk kepentingan bangsa dan negara. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya Profesor Dr. Abdul Halim Berkatullah, SHM Hum, Dekan dari Fakultas Hukum Universitas Lambung Mangkurat Banjarmasin, Kalimantan Selatan. Mengucapkan selamat dan sukses selalu Atas Desnatalis ke-25 Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan Semoga Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan Dapat terus berjaya dan berkarya Mendidik dan melahirkan putra putri bangsa Dalam bidang hukum dalam wadah kampus merdeka untuk Indonesia masa depan yang tangguh dan berjaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya Profesor Dr. Ahmad Sudiro, selaku Dekan Fakultas Hukum Universitas Taruman Negara Jakarta dan sebagai Ketua Umum Dewan Pimpinan Nasional Asosiasi Profesi Hukum Indonesia mengucapkan selamat disnatalis ke-25 kepada seluruh sivitas akademika dan keluarga besar Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan semoga dengan disnatalis ke-25 Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan semakin maju, semakin berkembang, dan semakin sukses di masa mendatang dalam pengembangan Tridharma Perguruan Tinggi. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, Om Swastiastu, Nama Budaya, Salam Kebajikan. Saya Kota Ibu Ketua Komisi Pertama Sebasa Perusahaan Republik Indonesia, atas nama Kondisiannya, dan sebetulnya Pak Ibu Ibu mengucapkan selamat atas perayaan ke-25 tahun Fakultas Hukum Universitas Negeri Tanah Harapan sejalan dengan tema yang diangkat pada momen ke-25 tahun ini yaitu Do Justice, Love Kindness, and Walk Humbly Semoga Fakultas Hukum Universitas Negeri Tanah Harapan dan Pak Ibu melahirkan pemimpin mas depan yang kompeten, profesional, tentunya melalui pendidikan yang unggul, holistik, dan transformasional untuk turut memberikan kontribusi kepada kita tercinta yang terjadi sekali lagi selamat kepada makta sepuluh pemerintah sepuluh anak Greeting from Chiang Mai University, Thailand. I am Natumon Kongjeren, the Dean. On behalf of the faculties and staff, I would like to express my joyful regards to everyone at the Faculty of Law, UPHA, on this special occasion of the 25th anniversary on July the 26th of the year 2021. There is my pleasure to have a warm friendship and collaboration with the UPHA Law School. We will strengthen our academic relationship and I certainly believe that UPHA and CNU will have fruitful results in these coming years. Kepada Sivitas Akademika, Fakultas Hukum, Universitas Pelita Harapan, saya mengucapkan selamat memperingati Dis Natalis ke-25. Saya yakin dan percaya kampus ini akan terus menghasilkan insan-insan hukum yang profesional, rendah hati, serta senantiasa menjaga nilai-nilai kebenaran dan keadilan. Sebab tidak ada keadilan kecuali dalam kebenaran. Tidak ada kebahagiaan kecuali dalam keadilan. Orang yang berlaku tidak adil, niscaya, tidak akan lebih bahagia, bahkan lebih menderita daripada orang yang mengalami ketidakadilan. Salam Konstitusi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Saya Profesor Dr. Edi Pratomo S.A.M.A Pada kesempatan yang berbahagia ini izinkan saya menyampaikan ucapan disnatalis yang ke-25 kepada Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan khususnya kepada Pak Dekan Profesor Bintan dan seluruh keluarga besar Sivitas Akademika Fakultas Hukum 
Universitas Pelita Harapan. Semoga dengan momentum di Natalis yang ke-25 ini, Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan akan terus maju, sukses dalam meraih cita-citanya. Sekian, selamat sekali lagi, salam sehat. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Halo, nama saya Dea Tungga Esti. Saya lulus dari Fakultas Hukum UPH tahun 2004. Kebetulan masuknya tahun 2000. Kesan dan pesan saya, selama saya menjadi mahasiswa di FH UPH, senang banget. Satu, dari segi pertemanan, luar biasa, teman-temannya kompak sampai dengan sekarang. Kedua, dari segi pendidikan, kita mendapatkan dosen-dosen yang sangat hebat, tidak hanya secara teori, tetapi juga memahami persis bagaimana praktek di dunia hukum itu. Jadi ilmu yang kita dapat adalah ilmu yang bisa langsung diaplikasikan ketika kita masuk ke dunia kerja. Selain daripada itu, saya senang sekali menjadi bagian dari FHUPH. Saya doakan agar FHUPH terus maju, terus mendidik anak-anak bangsa menjadi manusia-manusia yang hebat. Selamat untuk UPH. My name is Timothy Kiriwang. I'm a litigator and I practice international trade. I graduated from UPH in 2007. I practice law in Hanafia Pongawan Partners. During my life as a lawyer, I've encountered many problems, many mistakes. But what I learned in UPH is always to get back up and do it again. So in life, I always look to the future and I learn from my past. Lawyer itu profesi yang saya inginkan dari sejak sekolah. Lawyer itu identik dengan smart person. Lawyering can be fun, sibuk, tapi tetap bisa meluangkan waktu untuk keluarga dan teman. Semua tergantung bagaimana kita memanajinya. Pekerjaan yang kompleks dituntut untuk selalu sharp dalam berpikir dan menganalisa serta memberikan solusi bagi setiap permasalahan klien kita. Tidak ada namanya waktu libur. Klien selalu menjadi prioritas. Tetapi ketika kita menikmati apa yang kita kerjakan, semuanya tidak terasa berat. Saya Hendra Ong, saya partner di Dentons HPRP. My name is Timothy Kiriwang. I'm a litigator and I practice international trade. I graduated from UPH in 2007. Practice law in Hanafia Pongawan Partners. During my life as a lawyer, I've encountered many problems, many mistakes. But what I learned in UPH is always to get back up and do it again. In life, I always look to the future, and I learn from my past. Hai, saya Dea Tungga Esti. Saya alumni UPH tahun 2000 dan lulus tahun 2004. Sekarang profesi saya sebagai lawyer dan sebagai dosen. Kok suruh milih yang mana ya yang lebih menyenangkan di antara keduanya? Well, I love them both. Dua-duanya membuat saya terus update sama keadaan-keadaan yang ada di masyarakat. Tentunya dengan ilmu hukum yang terus berkembang secara dinamis. Buat saya, semua hal itu mungkin. Tinggal kemauan diri kita sendiri. Kalau kita percaya kita bisa, pasti semuanya bakal kita dapat.
Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Jakarta. Firstly, I want to introduce myself and my friend. My name is Tasha Mahira, and I'm here with my friend. Hello, everyone. My name is Dito Iskandar. Yes, and we'll be your master of ceremony for today. So it is a pleasure for us to welcome you on today's webinar on the topic of the regulation of COVID-19 mitigation in ASEAN and its application to the economic recovery. So as we know, COVID-19 cases in Indonesia are rising pretty quickly, but we hope that everyone here is doing well and of course, always follow the safety protocol of COVID-19. This webinar is brought to you by the Law Faculty of UPH in commemoration of its 25th anniversary. We would like to thank the Dean of Law Faculty, lecturers, our speakers, and participants for joining us today on our webinar. We would also like to give our appreciation to our sponsors that made this webinar possible. Firstly, our gold sponsors, Lipo Group, Denton's HPRP, Tandra and Associates, and we also have our silver sponsor, Tungga Ramli and Partners, Fanny Adelina Makeup Artist, Interpolitik, Walalangi and Partners, Dewi Jal and Partners, and also Kairani Mohkair Part and Partners. We also thank our media partner, Berita Satu Media Holdings, Kolaborasi Keadilan, Kampus Update, Legalinfo.id, Paham Hukum, Delete, Gatra Media Group, Informasi Hukum, Juris Wannabe, Legal Tizen, Pintar Hukum, Forum Keadilan, Point Kampus, dan Raja Grafindo Persada. Lawyer itu profesi yang saya inginkan dari sejak sekolah. Lawyer itu identik dengan smart person. Lawyering can be fun, sibuk, tapi tetap bisa meluangkan waktu untuk keluarga dan teman. Semua tergantung bagaimana kita memanajinya. Pekerjaan yang kompleks dituntut untuk selalu sharp dalam berpikir dan menganalisa serta memberikan solusi bagi setiap permasalahan klien kita. Tidak ada namanya waktu libur. Klien selalu menjadi prioritas. Tetapi ketika kita menikmati apa yang kita kerjakan, semuanya tidak terasa berat. Saya Hendra Ong, saya partner di Dentons HPRP. My name is Timothy Kiriwang. I'm a litigator and I practice international trade. I graduated from UPH in 2007. I practice law in Hanafia Pongawan Partners. During my life as a lawyer, I've encountered many problems, many mistakes. But what I learn in UPH is always to get back up and do it again. So in life, I always look to the future and I learn from my past. Hi, saya Dea Tungga Esti. Saya alumni UPH tahun 2000 dan lulus tahun 2004. Sekarang profesi saya sebagai lawyer dan sebagai dosen. Kok suruh milih yang mana ya yang lebih menyenangkan di antara keduanya? Well, I love them both. Dua-duanya membuat saya terus update sama keadaan-keadaan yang ada di masyarakat. Tentunya dengan ilmu hukum yang terus berkembang secara dinamis. Buat saya, semua hal itu mungkin. Tinggal kemauan diri kita sendiri. Kalau kita percaya kita bisa, pasti semuanya bakal kita dapat.
Okay, once again, thank you for all uh, our to our sponsors. So before we get started, I would like to read some of the rules of procedures that shall be followed by every participant of this webinar. Okay, so uh, first, participants are supposed to follow the whole webinar in a polite manner. And second, participants who wish to obtain the certificate of participant should fill the G form provided by the committee that will be sent throughout the event. Please be aware that the G-Form link will be different than the registration link. And lastly, Q&A will be held at the end of the session. And of course, participants who wish to ask questions can use the Q&A feature. And please kindly state your name and to whom is the question addressed to and state your question. Okay, I hope everyone will follow the rules. Before we go further, we think that it is best to start this webinar with a prayer. I would like to give the opportunity to my friend Vanessa Xavier Kylie to lead the opening prayer. All right, thank you, Dito. Honorable Dean, lecturers, speakers, participants, and fellow colleagues, uh, allow me to lead us in an opening prayer. Well, prayer will be done according to Christian value and participants with other belief may pray, uh, pray respectively. Let us open our hearts and put ourselves in the holy presence of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful morning that we can all gather here in this very moment to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Faculty of Law, Plita Harapan University through this webinar. Despite all the challenges we're facing, this current global situation, yet you still give us a chance to attend and make this webinar possible. Lord Jesus, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this webinar. Help us to engage in this meaningful discussion and continue to remind us that all we do today here is for the pursuit of truth for the greater glory of you. May we humbly commit every part of this webinar from the beginning up to the end into your hand. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you, Vanessa, for the opening prayer. Now I would like to ask all the participants to join me to sing the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. Thank you all. And our next session is welcoming remarks by the Dean of Faculty of Law UPH, Prof. Bintan R. Saragi. Thank you. Okay. The time is yours. You hear me, sir? Yes, Pa. Yeah, okay. Good morning to respected Associate Professor 
Dr. Hartini Saripan, Dean of Faculty of Law of Mara University of Technology, Malaysia. Associate Professor Dr. Ponchai, Assistant to the President of Chiang Mai University, former Dean of Faculty of Law of Chiang Mai University. Rachel Burgess, LLM, Southern Queensland University. Jose Rizal Damuri, PhD, Head of Department of Economic Center of Strategy and International Study, CSIS. Dr. Dian Parluhutan, SALLM, Lecturer of Faculty of Law of Polita Harapan as Presenter of International Webinar. Dr. Fajar Sugiarto as Moderator and our distinguished participant. I would like to welcome you all to the Faculty of Law of Polita Harapan University via online or webinar on the international webinar the regulation of COVID-19 migration in Asia and its application to the economic recovery. The winner is part of a series of scientific activities held to the commemorate the 25th anniversary or Dies Natalis of the Faculty of Law Pelita Harapan University, which was established in 1996. The Faculty of Law of Palita Harapan University believes that this 25th or 25th anniversary, this Natalis, should be celebrated to show gratitude to the God Almighty for his abundant blessing during his 25th year of journey. The Faculty of Law of Palita Harapan University is now continuing to grow or develop according to the vision and mission true knowledge, faith in Christ, and godly character. The Faculty of Law of Lita Harapan University is also continuing to expand or to develop in various fields, both in academic and non-academic, such as teaching and learning, research, community service, including the Legal Consultation and Aid Institute, LKBH, or Legal Aids, Outstanding alumni as judges, prosecutor, far as well known lawyer at national and international, the bureaucrat, such as regents, Indonesia State Bupati, and deputy regent, Wakil Bupati, member of the House of the Representative, and the House of Locus Legislative in Indonesia increasing facilities provided by the university to support the activity of the Faculty of Law, like IT, building, salaries, and others. Friendship and cooperation with other law faculty at national and abroad, such as Murdoch, Murdoch University, Asli, Mara University, led by Ibu Hatini, and Chiang Mai University. I hope through this winner and other activity that have been that have been and will be held, some recommendation of can be formulated which we use in on input to the government. In addition, through the winner with the current topic, it is expected, it is expected that will be provide a good conclusion. We need conclusion regarding managing in the impact of COVID-19 for the economic recovery, the duration of the impact of COVID-19 economic recovery. Through this forum, I would like to say thank you. To, me. Thank you to Buhatini again. I appreciate your associate Ponchai. Dr. Ponce, eh, Prof. Ponce, Rachel Vargas, Jose Rizal Damuri, Dr. Dian Parluhutan, Dr. Fajar Sugarto, and our distinction participant, Directorate, Head of the Team of Organizing Committee, all leader and lecturer of Faculty of Law, Universal Pilita Harapan. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Prof. Bintan, for the welcoming remarks. Before we move on, I would like to remind our audience that this webinar is sponsored by our gold sponsors, Lipo Group, Bintan HPRP, Tandra and Associates, and, and, our, and our silver sponsors, Tungga Ramli and Partners, Fanny Adelina Makeup Artist, Interpolitik, Walalangi and Partners, Dewi Jalal and Partners, and also Kairani Mohkair and Partners. Now let's introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Fajar Sugianto. He is a professional at several areas of law. He is a lecturer in UPH, an advocate, a mediator, a data protection officer, and he is also a senior fellow at Bali International Arbitration and Mediation Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Dr. Fajar Sugianto. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Dito. Hello, and thank you very much for having me. I am delighted to be here. And indeed, it is beautiful. To, uh, it is beautiful day today. And again, I'm happy to be moderating this webinar with you. Thank you all for finding the time for visiting and attending today's webinar. And together, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary Faculty of Law Universitas Prita Harapan. A very warm welcome to all. My name is Fajar Sugianto, and as a part of uh, today's webinar, I will be moderating the session. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Since we are using webinar format, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please kindly type them into the chat box. I'll bring them up during the presentation if necessary, or we will also have a time for Q&A at the end. Right before I turn the time over to our prominent speakers, I, I would like to have a quick moment to briefly introduce them to you. Our first speaker is Associate Professor Dr. Uh, Ponchai Wisutisak. Currently, he is the uh, assistant to President of Chiang Mai University. His specific areas of interest are competition and... Uh, I'm utility. sorry, Sir Fajar. Uh, yes? Sorry to interrupt. I think your camera is not working okay okay thank you sir Pardon me. um his specific areas of interest are competition and utility infrastructure law professor ponchai has conducted uh, numbers of funded research both by uh, the thai government body and vietnam ministry of justice some of them are competition law and small medium enterprises in retail business. Uh, it is a comparative study on Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia. Also uh, on ASEAN competition law for government offices and many more. He is an active member of Thai Customer Broker Association and still active uh, member of Young Competition Scholars. It is an interdisciplinary center for competition law and policy at Queen's Mary University of London, also a member of uh, Asian Competition Forum, uh, a group of academics in law and economics expert in competition law. And he is currently the uh, expert, uh, he's the uh, country expert of uh, franchise regulation in Thailand. Today, Professor Ponchai will uh, speak about Thailand legal frameworks and future cooperation on COVID-19 in ASEAN. Good morning and welcome again, Prof. Our next speaker is Rachel Burgess. She is a lecturer at the University of Southern Queensland, Australia. Her, uh, her areas of research interests are ASEAN competition and consumer law, access to justice for competition and consumer law breaches, the application of competition law to trade associations and the uh, impact of competition law and policy uh, on small medium enterprises. Furthermore, she's an academic and consultant with more than 20 years experience working as lawyer in private practice and government in Australia, the UK and Asia Pacific. Since 2010, Rachel has worked extensively in the Asia Pacific region where she has undertaken capacity building and technical assistance programs on behalf of the Australian Competition and Consumer uh, Commission, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, 
the Asian Development Bank, the Philippines Competition Commission, the Malaysia Competition Commission, and the uh, ASEAN Secretariat. Rachel was also the recipient of ANU Philippines Project Collaborative Research Grant in 2017 for evaluating the level of awareness of Competition Act in the Filipino micro, small, medium enterprises community. Today, she will be sharing to all of us about the role for competition law and policy in COVID-19 recovery. Good morning, uh, Rachel, and welcome again. And to Thank you, Rachel. And today's third speaker is uh, Associate Professor Dr. Uh, Hartini Saripan. Currently, she's the Dean, Faculty of Law, University Technology Mara. Her areas of research interests are law and technology, commercial law and e-commercial law, as well as law and artificial intelligence. Uh, numerous published papers around the world we can trace. Um, some of uh, the latest ones are liability framework for cognitive computing in healthcare, uh, standing at the crossroad, privacy in era of big data, unlocking the blue oceans of data paradigm in Malaysia. Professor Hartini Saripan is very familiar with universities in Indonesia, invited and selected speaker at several events at universities such as Faculty of Law, Universitas Pajajaran, Universitas Erlangga, UPN Veteran Jakarta, and many more. And today she will speak about COVID-19 responses and the impact on economic recovery, challenges, and way forward. Good morning, Professor, and welcome again. And Good our morning. thank you so much, Dr. Fajar. Good morning, Prof. Our first speaker is uh, Mr. Jose Rizal Damuri, PhD. Currently, he is a head of the Department of Economics at Center for Strategic and International Studies. His research activities focus on international trade, regional integration, and globalization of value chain. He is very active in several research and advisory networks, both in Indonesia and in East Asia, such as Indonesia Service Dialogue and Asia Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade. But Yose also teaches international economics courses at the Faculty of Economics, University of Indonesia. In addition, he often writes in local and national newspapers. Today, Yose will uh, speak about COVID-19, impact to economy, and necessary responses. A very interesting topic and suit with Pak Yose's areas of research interest. That is international economics, economic modeling, fiscal decentralization, poverty and income distribution, dan selamat pagi, selamat datang Pak Yose. Selamat pagi Pak Fajar, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Uh, thank you Pak Indit. And we have Dr. Dian Parluhutan as our fifth speaker. Dr. Dian is a, a full-time lecturer at Faculty of Law, Universitas Pelita Harapan, and currently he is a head of concentration unit of international law at Faculty of Law, Universitas Pelita Harapan. Moreover, he teaches competition law, international law, interna international dispute resolution, consumer protection law. Dr. Dian uh, has attended and invited a speaker at numbers of conferences, both nationally and internationally. Today, Dr. Dian will be speaking about role of Indonesian competition law and KPPU in supervising partnership agreement to accelerate the recovery of micro, small, medium enterprises from COVID-19. Indeed, a very interesting topic. Selamat pagi dan selamat datang, Pak Dian. Thank you, Pak Fajar. Salam sehat. Salam sehat, Pak. Now, without further ado, I will turn the time over to Associate Professor Dr. Ponchai Wisak. Over to you, Professor. Um, let me share the slide first. And then, okay. um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, the Faculty of Law, the Universitas Kalapani, for the invitation to this webinar. Um, thank you, Dr. Fajar, as the moderator and the coordinator, and on everything on the emails we have been working on together. And also, thank you, Professor Dr. Bintan Saranki. Um, he's the best dean that I ever seen in Indonesia because we cooperate two, three times already. Yeah, and right. also the friends of mine in um, faculty of law in Upeha. 
um, also the, the teams, organizing team, which is the new young generation, I say that. So this is the important um, webinar, and I think it will be better to share all the knowledge within the ASEAN and the Australia as well. Um, let me focus on um, the topic that I would like to present is, is about the Thailand legal frameworks. Let me present that. Um, it's about the Thailand legal frameworks and the future cooperation on COVID-19 in ASEAN. So most of, most of the slide will be talking about the Thailand legal frameworks that coping with the COVID-19. And however, on the last slide, I would like to, to propose something that at least we in ASEAN country and the other partners countries can be all together to work and mitigate the problem of the uh, COVID-19. So this is the outline of my slide. It's starting from um, the, the emergency decree on the public administration and also about the communal communicable disease acts and also it's about the agency who operate and mitigate and manage the issue of COVID-19 in Thailand which we call in Thailand COVID, which is the center for administration of COVID-19 situation um, and later, I will talk about the government mismanagement of the COVID-19, and that's the problem during today, with which we have about almost about 10 or 12,000 patents each day. So that, that's the outlines of um, the slides. And the last one of the slide will be the, the proposal, or at least my ideas that we can work through um, that is, the issue of the COVID in ASEAN and all the other partner countries in ASEAN as well. So let me start on the, the first important legal or the first important piece of law that admits the, that copes with the problem of the COVID-19 in Thailand. Um, the government used the emergency decrease on public administration in emergency situa situation. Um, the decree is, um, let me explain, the act is the parliament's uh, law, the emergency decrease is the um, equal level as the X, as the uh, parliament law. But we call emergency decree is because it's the government's um, legal mechanism to cope with the emergency situation. So that this is so we call the decree. Um, so the decree is on the public administration. Um, on section 11, it's point out that Prime Minister has the power to do everything. The Prime Minister of Thailand shall have the following powers. So according to the laws in emergency decree, he can issue any notification or any regulation to arrest or to postpone or suspect to any person that may create a problem to the emergency situation. And also he has the power to issue notification that to the competent official to help him or to do or to summon the people in order to make sure that the situation is under control. And the other one is the notification or regulation of um, to seize attached arm of a soybean or the goods products or the chemical product or healthcare product that have to be used for the COVID or have to be used for any emergency situation, which is especially in the COVID-19, the government can issue any seize of the product. Um, also, he has the power to issue the warrants and search and removal of anything on the building and so on. So this is the very important power to the prime minister. And the prime minister normally have the committee um, to decide what to issue. So most of the case, the, the, the prime minister will issue the regulation by his power under the section 11 of this emergency decree. And let's move on. So there are so many power by the prime minister to, to cope with the issue of the um, emergency situation, especially in the COVID-19. Um, so it extends all the power and government can use any security measure to make sure that all the um, situation is under control. But I will tell you later, even we have the law on book, which is this is the law on book. However, it cannot be easily according to the law. So 
this is the the the, the law that I I present is the important power from the prime minister and the prime minister can um, issue the authoritative power to any competent officer on behalf of the prime minister to manage the problem. I will tell you later how he um, authorized the power to any provinces, to the, some provinces, to the governor of the provinces. We call the central policy plus the government um, um, provincial policy altogether is parallel co cooperation. However, the co parallel cooperation is under the same framework of the emergency decree. Yes, ma'am. Yep. So, um, the summary of the regulation just um, June, in June and July in 2021. So, he, the Prime Minister used his power according to the Emergency Act and issue the regulation, which is we call the royal decree, which is, has to be passed by the, the central government. Um, it's giving the power to the each province mayor and committee to manage the situation. It means that the governments in Bangkok by the prime minister have the legal power, but he authorized the um, mayor or the governor of the province area, provincial areas to manage the problem. It means that the governors or the provincial mayor is having the same power with the prime minister. So in this sense, it makes sense because um, prime minister in Bangkok or in the center of Thailand may not be easily deal with the problem in Chiang Mai or in the other province in Thailand. So most of the case, all the quarantine or the lockdowns in each province will come from the provincial mayor who issue the regulation subject to the authority power of the prime minister. So if you follow, that means that we have the, um, the legal framework on the national, then we give the power to the provincial area, then the provincial mayor will have the power to, to work on and to cope with the situation. For example, in Chiang Mai, the provincial mayor in, in Chiang Mai will be the person um, who have authority power to issue any lockdown or any strict control to the people. Um, so let's move on. Most of the case in Bangkok and the central area in Thailand, they issued a curfew according to the Emergency Act. So from 10 p.m. until 4 a.m., people can move or people have to stay at home. Um, it means that uh, all the activity has to be finished at 10 p.m. If only you have to do after 10 p.m. You have to have the documents stating that what would you have to do after 10 p.m. For example, nurse or doctor that they have to do um, at the night shifts. So, so that that's 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 the the policy enforcement policy of the curfew of the regulation on curfews. And also, we have a restriction on alcohol and sale consumption. Most of the guests in Bangkok and the vicinity area of the Bangkok, they are order alcohol sales to be stopped and not to have any pubs or bars open and for consumption of alcohol. So this is very strict, strict policy. And also they, they have a lockdown in specific areas. So for example, they have the lockdowns on labor camps in Bangkok. There are so about 100 labor camps um, in Bangkok, so the government issued a lockdown because they have the COVID-19 patient in their camps. And so the government asked to have a lockdown in some specific places and areas. And also they have the travel bans crossing provinces. For example, if you come from Bangkok to Mai Chiang Mai in the northern of Thailand, you will have to quarantine 14 days. It means that kind of the bans that you cannot easily get in get out from your provinces and I not easily and I am not easily get into Bangkok this time. So this is the ban that government tried to drop it according to the emergency, emergency decree. And also they closed all potential business that causing spreads. So if you have one case in one business, then the government will issue 14 day close in order to make sure that they can manage the situation in that shop or in that business. And then after 14 days, you can open that shop. Okay. And also they have no congregation of the people. So not uh, according to the laws, 
not more than five people can be all together in one place. For example, you, you congregate or you have to protest. You cannot protest more than five people. So this is the very severe law and restricted on the people. But it's understandable because the government, according to the emergency acts, want to cope with that um, COVID-19 problem in Thailand. So let me move on. So the section 18 also um, gives the power and set the punishments. So they said any person who violate a regulation or notification or order under section 9, 10, 11, and 13, which is mostly is on section 11, um, they will have to be imprisonment for a term of existing, not, not um, more, more than two years, and the fines not more than 40,000 baht. So most of the case, they, um, the, the police will be easily not to enforce. However, only in severe case, they will enforce that law against the people who try to breach or infringe the law. Um, some of the case, <laughs> even I can, um, one of the students, I don't know, one group of the students last year in Chiang Mai, um, they congregate together about five or six people to have the party. On that point, the government, the police, issue the fire to them because they they intentionally um, breach or infringe the law of the emergency. So this is the case, for example. Um, let me move on to another to another law that is imp another important law um, on the Communicable Disease Act. This is the act mostly used by the Ministry of Health, but the act now has been um, the, the power according to the act has been uh, authorized to the prime minister already. So it means that Ministry of Health not easily has not, and he's not easily used the power because the prime minister asked that power to become to his power. So this is kind of the bureaucratic system in Thailand. But anyway, I can extend to you later on the question. Let me explain to you on about the communal thesis. Um, if I'm going too quick or I have short of time, please let me know. Um, the communicable disease on section seven issue the 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 law that for the purpose of prevention of communicable disease the minister which is now the prime minister with approval of the committee shall have the power to prescribe any following notification. It means that this act gives the power to issue any notification, which is the declaration. And if you breach notification you will have punished, I mean, um, uh, infringe the law as well. So this is the kind of legal system in Thailand. Um, according to the, to the section seven, um, the government in provincial areas or even in the center of Bangkok, they issue the regulation on events of occurrence of dangerous communicable disease. And they have issued the procedures and condition to assure the order and cope with the disease. And also there are so many plenty of the regulation that we have to follow. Most of the case that you cannot come on more than five people, you cannot come out at the nighttime or you cannot drink alcohol and so on. So this is kind of the, the same story in, in Bangkok and in provinces in Thailand. And all provinces will have to be under the provincial mayor. Communal disease acts give the power to each provinces as well. For, let me explain first. The communal communicable disease give the power to minister and the minister mostly give the power to the provincial mayor. So most of the case, the provincial mayor have to use both power of the emergency acts and communicable disease acts altogether. Um, and also this is the example of the provincial communicable, communicable disease, um, which is, uh, the, govern, the provincial governors or the mayor as a chairman will be the heads of the committee and all the committee are come together in order to, to issue or to decide any laws. I will show you this is the picture of Chiang Mai mayor and he's the one who have to pronounce regulation or to have to issue any regulation and most of the case, the, some of the staff in Chiang Mai University would have to get involved because Chiang Mai is the medical um, the university as well. So some of the doctor from Chiang Mai has to be in that committee in order to issue any law in for coping with the COVID-19 in Chiang Mai. 
and it's all the same in provinces in Thailand. We have 77 provinces in Thailand. So all the 77 mayors or province governor, provincial governor have to issue the law or issue the regulation according to the communicable disease. So this is the story of the, the, the communicable disease. Um, and also by the centralized policy, the centralized policy will use the information from the provincial um, data into Bangkok and then in the center they will issue any um, strict control in some provinces for example if you see this the red one which is very very strict control and another not to read is about it's under the control but not too strict and for example another 25 provinces it's not too strict because it's in the yellow and if the in the yellow, it's, not, it's, it's okay to do anything. So this is kind of the story that the central policy under the two laws, the, the emergency decree and the communal problem, this is uh, all together giving the power to the government to restrict or to control and to deal with COVID-19. Um, if you breach the law, um, especially the communal problem, this is which is um, there will be the one month imprisonment or the case the the fight is not more than ten thousand baht. The fight is not is okay, but the, the imprisonment is not okay for the people at all. So this is the two main law. Okay. Let me explain further about the law. I mean about the the agency or the institution that set up as the committee to cope with the COVID nineteen as well. So according to the both law law on disease and law on emergency, they give the power to set up a committee. And then the committee become the center for administration of COVID-19 situation. So every day we will see um, the communication from the center. So um, the, the center is the ad hoc committee under the prime minister. And most of the member of the committee is the doctor. And the central government agency set out the policy. So they will have set the policy at the center and give the policy to the provinces. And provinces have to or normally follow the central policy according to the baseline of the policy. So for example, if Chiang Mai is under the red zone, so we have to act or to issue regulation in Chiang Mai according to the central policy. And all and Later, and another point of the center of the center for administration committee is they they have the statistic collection and report to the public, and every day last year we 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 waiting to see the communication from the center, and we see only one case, and now on um from January and no, no, from April until now we seen about nine thousand cases or ten thousand cases, so we feel that. The, the center for administration is not that that effective enough to issue to to cope with the case. Okay, um, they also having the power to report to the cabinet, and the cabinet by the prime minister can issue any warning or any declaration according to the emergency emergency acts. So this is the instruction that um, the ad hoc committee, which is the center for administration set the policy to all the people for the restriction of 14 days um, quarantine of the practices. So let me move on, not to take you too long, but this is very important point of my slide as well. The government mismanagement of COVID-19. I just updated this, uh, the newspaper on the website that the government tend not to be effective enough to manage the COVID-19. Let me move on this first important part is the regulatory and policy issue on COVID-19. Um, the government does not provide transparent information on vaccines and agreement on the vaccine. So every people in Thailand last year waiting for a choices of um, vaccines. However, the government say that, okay, we only have the Sinovac and AstraZeneca. Let me start on the point. I'm not telling that any vaccine is bad or not or good, but I'm saying that people want to have the choice of vaccines. However, the government does not provide any 
uh, choices or not provide transparent information about the agreement that government set for the vaccine to be imported into Thailand. And that's why we have no choices. Uh, most of the case, we have shortage of the vaccines because we have no choices as well. Um, even the private entity have to process their vaccine by themselves and pay by their pockets, not the government pocket. The reason is because the government is, the, is from the laws and policy, government then become the bottleneck is a bureaucratic system in Thailand. You have the power according to the law, but law cannot easily change. So the government has to act according to the law. If there is any law or regulation that suspend any import or have to wait for the standardized of the vaccine. So this is the government have to follow the laws. However, in this situation, it's become the government is the bottleneck of everything and of the, the, of the, of the vaccine import. And also the government tend to delay off the queue of the vaccines because um, they, they set ineffective agreements with some of the supplier of the vaccines. So that the, I will explain to you later, I will disclose some of the um, contract of the government to you. Um, and also the, there is no effective centralized policy on managing the vaccine. Um, each day now on, we will have most of the hospital come out on the Facebook and say that, okay, I have no vaccine because government doesn't send the vaccines to the hospitals. And all the patent, all the people who wait for the vaccine have to be canceled. Even they come to the hospital, they cannot get the vaccines according to the queue set on the mobile phone. The reason is because government doesn't supply the vaccine to the hospital according to what government say. So this is the issue in Thailand. Even they have two power of the law. So for example, this is the very important, but it's in Thai language, but I will explain to you. The GPO is the government pharmacy organization and the government pharmacy organization has to work with the Minister of Health, which is the Department of Communicable Disease. Um, and the GPO have to be the middleman to contact with the vaccine supplier and this is the situation where the government on both agency or both department become the bottleneck to everything. So we wait for the vaccines almost about six months, but the GPO or the government just signed agreement with the, the agency or the supply of the vaccines. So this is um, during the past two months, then the private hospital and the private enterprise now saying that, okay, let me bypass that bottleneck. We will order by ourselves. And even they ask for that, the government say that, okay, you can order by yourself, but you have to make sure that you, you justify the standard of the government. Even if it's the Pfizer, even if it is the Moderna, or even if it is the AstraZeneca, you cannot easily order by yourself. And this is the very most urgent, I'll tell you, this is the confidential, but it's not confidential anymore because it's the newspaper in Thailand has spread all the way. Um, is the, the letter from the Minister of Health on 30th of June, just last month, sent to AstraZeneca, asked for 10 million vaccines. However, let me show you another one. So the AstraZeneca white president sent the letter back to the minister saying that Okay, you on June on September, 7th September, you order only 3 million vaccine. How come you are you ask me to supply 10 million? So this is the proof of the mismanagement of the government in Thailand. And that's why the, all the private entity, all the enterprise in Thailand has to work by themselves in order to get to the vaccines to that people or to their staff in the businesses. Um, I will share with you more later. But anyway, this is a very important one. Um, and this is the timeline. On um, September last year, um, they said the Ministry of Health in Thai language, but anyway, I will explain to you briefly. The Ministry of Health say that we will have 3 million doses of the vaccine each month. However, we say on the 30th of June, they said, okay, we will ask for 10 million doses per month. But 
it doesn't come easily because the government doesn't set any agreement effective enough to ask the AstraZeneca to supply. So that's the issue. And we also use the Sinovac. Again, I will not say that any vaccine is bad or not bad on a good, because I have two, two vaccines from the Sinovac already and one, one jab from AstraZeneca, so I cannot say any, anything is bad. But it's good to have the vaccines. However, the government doesn't effectively manage the vaccines to the people. And this becomes a problem because they issue the restriction according to the emergency situation, according to the law that I said. However, they ask all the people to check and to get the detection of the COVID-19. So all the publish people, I say the poor people, I cannot about anyway, they don't have the money to get the detection because the detection cost is about one is about 50, no, no, 30 US dollars. And the poor people cannot afford that. Then you have to get the free detection of the COVID-19 from the hospital or from the government entity or from the temple. You see the people lie up last week for detecting the COVID-19. And it's not that easy because the government issue, the they restriction and not people to gather more than five people and how many people lying down here. So this is the awkward situation using the law enforcement with the problem of the people. And I say it's not effective enough in Thailand. And so this is the Thai situation. I'm, I'm sad that to share some sad situation, situation in Thailand. But anyway, let's look on the positive side. I think we have the, the cooperation uh, we would be better positioned if we cooperate in ASEAN's level. The first thing is that we should have the cooperation on recreation dealing with the quarantine in border areas. Um, most of the case, the people in um, from Myanmar, Laos, and Thai to Laos and to Myanmar, they cross the border every day. Um, once we issue the restriction not to cross the border, it means that they have to smuggle by them cross the border by themselves, I mean, illegally cross the border. So I think it will be best that we have the regulation and the mechanism to permit or to ensure and to manage the cross border. Because um, the DC, the COVID-19, this is not only one country problem, it's become the pan asian problem as well, and pan global problem as well. So that, that's the issue that I think we have to look, look and we have to work on. We only manage the, the problem by our one country. However, we cannot manage only one country. For example, in Thailand, we look at Myanmar. Myanmar has got worse situation. And of course, the people in Myanmar would like to get in Thailand. And of course, they smuggle in. I'm not saying that smuggle is bad, but at least we have to help them and to make sure that we can have the quarantine site or we have the quarantine helping each other during the the very important situation of the COVID-19. And if possible, I would like to propose the framework for communicable disease, not only by the COVID-19, because we see the problem of the COVID-19 as only one issue. For me, I think we have to deal with another future disease. So the COVID-19 is, yes, is the urgent. However, the COVID-19 is urgent, but in the long term, we may have to look at the other communicable disease. And we have to manage the emergency situation altogether in ASEAN because we have the border and we have we're not too far from each other. We can take the flight to Indonesia only two, two and a half hours. So that's, this is the story. And it is it's important that after we have the law, we have to have the co-management of the disease. For example, if we have the vaccine in Thailand and we have oversupplied of vaccine, we have under the co-management have to send the vaccines to any countries in ASEAN that need that. So this is the hand-in-hand co-management, which is important. And if possible, in the future, um, we will, I would say together, we most lovely to have the bubble cooperation on the travel. So the, the travel regulation have to come together with the bubble cooperation, for example, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, um, Malaysia and, Sing and Indonesia and Singapore all together 
if we can manage together, we may have to bubble cooperation of the travel together. This is this is the positive side. Think on a positive way, and that I think ASEAN will have to work together, not only by one country. For example, Malaysia and Singapore is in the border. How can Singapore be zero um, COVID nineteen patient, but Malaysia has about ten thousand patients each day? So it time by time they will move to Singapore anyway. The same in Thailand with Myanmar and Laos and Cambodia as well. So this is the situation that I think we have to all um, create the co-management and create a legal framework in the regional framework of the ASEAN. So I will, this is the end of my slide, and I would like to thank you again for the Opeha and Terimakasi Hapun Kap from Chiang Mai, and I hope that we can cooperate in future. Uh, thank you for all for the gold sponsor and silver sponsor as well, and the media partners. Thank you. Um, to just it, love kindness and walk humbly. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Professor. It it, it was a uh, it was very interesting topics, and I. President believe that we will have and we shall be expecting uh, many questions about that. Okay, shall we move on to our next speaker? Uh, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Rachel Burgess. Over to you, Rachel. I th thank you very much, Dr. Shvaja. Um it is a very great pleasure and an honour to be presenting on this webinar today. Thank you very much to uh, Udin and Diane who invited me originally um, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody in um, Indonesia from Brisbane, Australia. Um, may I just take this moment to uh, firstly wish uh, UPH a very happy 25th anniversary of the Faculty of Law. It is certainly a significant milestone um, and also to um, express my uh, prayers and well wishes for those in Indonesia who are not very well at the moment. I know Udin is uh, unwell at the moment, um, so I send my prayers and well wishes to Udin, his family, and, and all those who are uh, suffering from this dreadful um, disease in Indonesia and Thailand and our friends across ASEAN. Um, <clears throat> today, um, my topic, I will just share my slides. Um, is um, looking at um, the uh, effect of the uh, pandemic, um, looking very closely at um, or, or recognising the effect of the pandemic on MSMEs. And uh, my background, as you heard, is uh, competition law and policy. Uh, so I have done some research um, on behalf of um, the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific, UNESCAP, um, looking at how competition law and policy can help MSMEs recover in the um, uh, Asia Pacific region, or actually specifically in the ASEAN region. Um, so it is that research that I'd like to share with you today, um, as well as some other ideas that um, have come along since. Um, before I, um, so I'll give you just a, a little overview first. Um, what I would like to start with is how competition law and policy is relevant to MSMEs and COVID-19, because competition policy isn't the first thing you think of when you think about COVID-19. Um, I'm then going to talk you through some of the competition issues that we've observed um, arising during the pandemic um, and how the competition authorities um, in ASEAN particularly, but also some examples in other parts of the world, have responded to those competition issues. Um, and finally, um, I'll end with some recommendations of how competition law can be used as a tool to recover uh, from this uh, pandemic. So um, I'm conscious that not everyone in the audience will be as familiar with competition law and policy as um, perhaps Ponchai and I are. Um, so I thought I would start um, with a, a very brief overview for you on what competition law and policy is trying to achieve, um, which will hopefully then uh, put us in a good place to understand how it can help with COVID recovery. Um, you will hear the terms competition policy and you'll hear the terms competition law. They are actually two different things. 
Um, so competition policy is a wider concept, um, looking at the broad set of government policies and principles that promote the idea of competition. So most countries have trade policies um, and policies that facilitate market entry and exit. So that, that would also be encompassed within the idea of competition policy. Competition law is the more specific legislation and regulations that deal with anti-competitive practices. And generally, there is a body of case law that interprets that law and regulation, and all of that um, compi um, comprises um, what we would call competition law. Um, all the ASEAN member states have competition laws in operation now, with the exception of Cambodia. Um, but the news from there as recently as yesterday is that that is progressing uh, through their parliament. Um, so hopefully that law will be passed very soon. Um, so what do competition laws do? Generally, they prohibit three main areas um, or, or, or uh, conduct. The first one is any competitive agreements. So um, if there is an agreement between two competitors that is designed to manipulate the market, whether that be by altering the prices um, or sharing markets, um, those types of agreements um, are prohibited by most competition laws. Um, the second category is where a large entity um, uses its dominant position to gain um, a further market advantage. Um, and that's generally called the abuse of dominance. And I'm sure that any of you that have had anything to do with MSMEs, MSMEs will regularly tell you there are large players who don't play fairly in the market. Um, and this is the sort of conduct that that second type of prohibition is intended to um, uh, uh, prohibit. The third is anti-competitive mergers. Um, so where two entities want to combine, competition laws say, well, we need to have a look at that. We need to decide whether the market can withstand that merger, whether there's going to be any competition left after the merger has happened, or whether we actually have to stop that merger because otherwise um, the market will become anti-competitive. Um, some competition laws also deal with unfair trading practices in the ASEAN region. Not all of them, but some of them do. So that gives you an overview, hopefully, of what competition law is trying to do. And if you step back, the real objective of competition law and policy is to try to achieve a level playing field is the term that's used in competition law land. What it's trying to do is say that everybody who wants to participate in a market, whether they be small or large or state-owned enterprises, everybody should be playing by the same rules and therefore everybody um, has an equal opportunity to, um, to, to gain, um, you know, to, to work in that um, market. So um, competition laws in the Western um, world tend to focus their objective on consumer welfare. You know, the idea behind competition law is to make sure that consumers have the best available product at the best, best available price. Um, the policy objectives stated in the other ASEAN member state laws um, also cover some other ideas which I raise here because they're relevant to the COVID um, pandemic. Um, some of the laws deal with promotion of competition as an objective. Um, many of them look at economic efficiency and many also um, recognise that competition policy leads to economic growth. So um, when we're looking at recovery, economic recovery, um, then the competition laws themselves have acknowledged that economic growth is a key objective of competition law. So the two do work very much hand in hand. So how does competition law then help MSMEs? Um, at a very simple level, I think it helps in two ways. Um, competition law helps keep that level playing field that we've been that I've talked about already. It means that MSMEs should be able to compete alongside um, big companies without um, any disadvantage. Everybody should have the same opportunities. The second area is that um, the 
competition laws actually provide MSMEs with an opportunity to report anti-competitive behaviour. So if they are experiencing any competitive agreement in their market or they're feeling that the large players are misusing their power, then competition laws give the MSMEs an opportunity to report that conduct and to have that conduct investigated. Um, the catch in most places, Indonesia is an exception, um, but the catch in most places is that MSMEs also need to comply with competition law. Um, of course, there is a, an exemption for small businesses in um, Indonesia. Um, so as I'm talking through this today, um, the solutions may not appear directly relevant to MSMEs, but I think what we need to keep in mind is the importance of preserving that competitive market because if we preserve the competitive market, then there are opportunities um, for the MSMEs to participate and, and leading to economic growth. Okay, so um, we have um, competition authorities now established across the ASEAN member states. And those competition authorities generally have very similar powers or mandates. And these mandates will also be really important um, in the post-COVID era. Um, the, the main, um, the, well, the most important mandate is the first one that I have there, which is that the competition authorities are allowed or authorised to give advice generally to their governments on competition policy matters. One of my recommendations later will be that um, competition authorities make sure that competition policy is part of the package of economic recovery policies um, when we come out of COVID-19. So the competition authorities in the member states will have a really important role in making sure that competition isn't forgotten. When we're scrambling to put together economic recovery packages, we need to make sure that competition policy factors in that. So that will be an important role for the competition authorities. Um, competition authorities also um, have uh, a, a mandate to interact with sector regulators, um, energy regulators, water regulators, telcos, um, and to keep them um, aware and cognizant of the importance of competition in their sectors. Um, and also, um, and the point leads very nicely on from Pornchai's ending point about the cooperation amongst the ASEAN member states. Cooperation in relation to competition, law and policy uh, will be important on a regional level as we try to recover uh, from the pandemic. And also internationally, um, international competition authorities um, are also working um, to, to recover, to assist recovery in their own jurisdictions. Nope. Okay, so what competition um, policies or competition issues have we seen come out of COVID-19? And it's funny, I've done two pieces of research, one for UNCTAD on a global level and then one for UNESCO on the ASEAN level. And we saw very similar behaviours coming around the world, really, um, in relation to COVID-19. I'm going to cover each of these in turn. Um, the first one is looking at the impact of government support, so usually financial support. Uh, we've all experienced, I think, many aspects of panic buying during the pandemic. Uh, we have the issue of failing firms, which I'll explain in a minute. And we also have um, the, the overwhelming uh, importance of digital marketplaces as, as we have moved through the um, pandemic. Each of those have given rise to slightly different competition issues, which I'll, I'll talk you through now. So, um, this table here um, represents um, the types of financial assistance that were given to MSMEs um, in response to COVID-19 across the ASEAN region. Um, so you can see that debt deferral um, was quite um, broadly um, a, a response from the government, um, as was new lending to MSMEs, um, and you know, and also I guess a relaxation of the lending conditions. What um, you know, what, I, I don't intend on talking to you about the pros and cons of those various types of financial assistance today. But the point from a competition perspective is that 
um, where those that assistance has been given um, to entities, it may not have necessarily been given on an equal footing. So there may be some businesses that qualified for assistance in some jurisdictions and others didn't, um, which then puts um, immediately, it, it unlevels the level playing field. Um, so that is something that government um, support needs to bear in mind that there may have been inadvertently a creation of an unlevel playing field by virtue of the financial assistance uh, provided. The um, panic buying is a, is a really interesting one and I'm sure that we've all experienced going to the supermarket at some point during the pandemic and not being able to buy um, an item that we were looking for. The panic buying gave rise to a couple of different competition law issues. Um, the first one is what we call a crisis cartel. So a crisis cartel arises where you have um, competitors that come together and agree things that they shouldn't agree, like maybe the price of the product or how they're going to distribute supply. Um, and they do that because they believe there is a crisis and that the only way to manage that crisis is by agreeing together how to do it. Now, this type of behaviour is normally strictly prohibited by competition law. But what we've seen um, around the world, actually, is relaxation of those prohibitions in relation to uh, crisis cartels during the pandemic. Now, there's been different approaches to that relaxation. So Indonesia now has um, a regulation that provides a fairly wide relaxation of competition law um, rules. Um, Australia has, and I'll give you this example because I think it helps understand, um, helps uh, to illustrate very well a crisis cartel. Um, we have a big supermarket chain here called Coles. So Coles wanted to talk to all of the other supermarket um, uh, supermarkets here in Australia and agree how they would manage the supply chain because obviously we were having, you know, there was lots of supply issues as there were everywhere else. And the supermarket said, well, we would like to all talk, we'd all like to all agree how we allocate the resource and supplies that are coming in to make sure that they go out to the widest selection of consumers so that consumers can go into their shops and buy what they need to buy. Now, that would be prohibited normally, but Australia has a power within its laws to um, authorise, they call it authorisation, to authorise conduct. It's basically giving them permission to do that. So the ACCC gave the supermarkets permission to talk with one very important condition, which was that the ACCC were going to be part of those discussions. So our competition regulator actually sat at the same table with the supermarkets and um, basically to make sure, like a bit of a policeman, to make sure that they weren't talking about things that shouldn't have been talked about. So we see um, uh, across the world a recognition that uh, there might need to be a little bit more cooperation, particularly in relation to essential goods and services during the pandemic than what would normally be permitted. Uh, price gouging is the other issue that panic buying has created. Um, and price gouging is where you have uh, someone charging a lot more for a product that's highly in demand. So if we use the face mask, for example, um, you know, someone charging a very high price for the face mask because they know they're in demand um, would be price gouging. Um, it, it can be treated differently in competition laws. Here in Australia, we, we don't prohibit price gouging at all, um, but it might fall under our abuse of dominance provisions. Um, I know in parts of ASEAN, um, Malaysia, I think also Thailand, um, there are price control rules. Um, so the price control mechanisms might um, step in to deal with that sort of price gouging. Um, I mentioned failing firms. Um, we know that um, businesses are finding this uh, pandemic and the, the uh, closures of businesses um, and, and the like. Um, Porn Chai has given us good examples in Thailand and they resonate around um, the rest of ASEAN and, and the Asia-Pacific and the world. 
Um, businesses are being forced to close sometimes for extended periods of time and that is resulting in in businesses that are failing. Um, We may see as a result of that um, more mergers. So where a success or a business that's managed to survive the pandemic buys businesses that have failed during the pandemic. Um, There is... uh, an exception or a defence in competition law that allows a firm that's buying a failing company um, to be able to do that even where the result is anti-competitive if it can be shown that that firm was going to leave the market anyway. So this firm was failing, they were going to leave, um, so really there's no harm in them merging because at the end of the day that failing firm would have left anyway. Um, the the, uh, competition authorities around the world have remained pretty um, solid on their view in relation to failing firms. Um, They've said that they're not going to apply any special rules just because it's COVID. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. Although, um, and they will probably just keep applying the same rules as they've always applied in relation to failing firms. Um, We haven't seen a lot of evidence of failing firm defence being used yet. I suspect it's still quite early because some government support is still ongoing. Firms maybe are managing to stay afloat. Um, So it'll be interesting to watch over the coming 12 to 18 months um, to see the extent to which failing firm defence is relied on in relation to mergers. Finally, in relation to competition issues, um, we have the digital marketplace um, being used an enormous amount um, during the pandemic. Lots of businesses have moved online. We're all meeting online and doing much more online than we were previously. Before the pandemic, competition authorities were already starting to feel a little bit concerned about the power of the digital platform providers. They were already big. Um, and certainly the move to digital marketplaces has has not um, lessened their power in any way. Um, So uh, competition authorities continue during the pandemic to look at the power of the digital platform providers. From an MSME perspective, I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that not all MSMEs have access to the internet and certainly not all... um, Areas of a country, areas of a region, areas of the world have internet um, connections that are necessarily reliable all the time. Um, So that has a massive impact on the ability of some MSMEs to compete effectively. Okay, so how have um, the competition agencies um, around the world responded to these competition issues? Uh, Pretty much um, without exception, the agencies that have come out and spoken have all made clear two things. Firstly, that competition law um, must continue to be enforced throughout the pandemic um, and that it will play a really important role in the recovery. So those two points have been reiterated by competition authorities everywhere and and, um, international organisations like the OECD. Um, I have for you on the slide there um, the joint statement published by the ASEAN Experts Group on competition um, quite early on in the pandemic, reinforcing the importance of competition law and policy. And they actually specifically mention price gouging and say that price gouging won't be tolerated in the ASEAN region. Um, The um, Competition and Consumer Commission of Singapore also issued a guidance note Um, dealing with crisis cartels, um, recognising that there might be a greater need for collaboration between competitors. But it did um, include this warning that I put at the bottom of this slide, um, telling business that they're not, it's not going to be tolerated if they try to take advantage of the COVID pandemic as a cover to engage in practices that don't generate economic benefit. So even though 
um, Singapore was recognising that there might be a need for collaboration at the same time as it's saying don't use the pandemic as an excuse for anti-competitive behaviour that isn't, um, isn't justified. Um, the competition agencies around the world have continued with investigations during this process um, and this period. Um, Indonesia was very quick to investigate allegations of effectively price gouging for rapid tests for COVID very early on um, in the pandemic, and they reported um, to government very shortly afterwards. I think it was a three- or four-month turnaround for their inquiry. Um, interestingly, by the time Indonesia, um, the KPPU and the Indonesian Authority reported, most, um, most of the uh, companies that had been charging too much had changed their behaviour. So the investigation obviously had some impact on um, those companies. Um, in the UK, very recently, as recently as last week or the week before, um, a complaint's been lodged with the UK authority, the CMA, um, against Amazon for allegedly price gouging um, in, during the pandemic um, in relation to the price of face masks and hand sanitizer. So we'll see if the UK CMA takes that case on. Um, and in Australia, we had the Australian uh, Competition Authority also has jurisdiction over consumer law. And this was a consumer case. Um, but we had um, we have a brand of ac active wear here called Lorna Jane, and shortly after the um, pandemic started, they came out with a range of active wear that they claimed had been sprayed with something special that would stop the spread of COVID nineteen, uh, which of course was not couldn't be scientifically um, supported. Um, so the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission have actually taken them to court. Um, for what they're calling misleading representations to uh, to consumers. So the com competition authorities have been very um, active uh, during this period. There's also been legislative responses. Uh, we heard from Pong Chai the legislative responses in, in Thailand. Um, specifically relating to competition law, the Indonesian um, Commission has a, a regulation that relaxes the application of competition law quite broadly as I've mentioned already. Um, in the Philippines, um, legislation was introduced that actually removed the Philippine Competition Commission's mandate to review mergers uh, where they had a value of less than 50 billion uh, pesos for the next, for the two years from the, the date of the um, legislation. Um, that uh, effectively, I guess, is, is permitting failing firms to be bought without review um, in the Philippines, but um, I think perhaps is, is quite frustrating for the Philippine Commission to have had that mandate removed for that period of time. Um, but it did, the same piece of legislation reinforced um, the mandate to take measures against price manipulation, profiteering, hoarding and the like um, in the Philippines. And the PCC responded very strongly um, to that legislation um, and that um, prohibition on profiteering, et cetera, and said, well, we are going to work even harder to ensure the consumer, to ensure that consumer welfare and competition are safeguarded um, because it's a time when small business um, and consumers are really quite vulnerable. Um, so there's some very strong statements come out of the agencies as well as the legislative responses. Okay, I'm conscious of time. Um, this is my last slide and, and I'll give you here um, the suggestions that um, we included in the report as to how competition policy can be used by um, jurisdictions across ASEAN um, to, to assist with recovery. Um, the first one is the... Uh, point I really started with, which is that there is um, a mandate within each of the competition authorities to provide policy advice to government. Um, the competition authorities can use that mandate here to try to ensure that competition policy forms part of that package of economic recovery policies around the region. I think that's very important. 
the authorities also need to continue to enforce their competition law and continue, need to continue to be seen to be enforcing. Um, and that's, you know, that's really important that businesses are aware that, um, that they are actively um, pursuing anti-competitive behaviour. Um, the third point is um, tied to the first one about ensuring that that competition policy is part of the economic recovery. Um, we should um, be ensuring that across the ASEAN region, um, the benefits of competition law and policy to MSMEs um, continue to be advocated. Um, and that can be done through enforcement by using examples of cases that have helped MSMEs, but also using trade associations as a means to get that message through. Um, and I also think it's worth just reminding ourselves that um, although I think it's quite um, natural and it's a human instinct to try and protect ourselves um, during this pandemic period, um, we should co consider very carefully policies that support protectionism. Um, if we have foreign firms that can come into our jurisdictions um, going forward, then that will help with competition. Um, and um, it, it means that there'll be greater competition with those foreign firms, but also within the domestic market, there will be greater competition, which ultimately will be better for economic growth. Um, so we shouldn't be frightened to allow foreign firms back in once um, borders reopen. Um, and we also, I think, can remind MSMEs that um, because they're small, they're very agile and often they can respond very quickly to changing marketplaces, which I'm sure many of them have done throughout this period. Um, and that can give MSMEs a very strong competitive advantage um, over some of the larger entities. So um, I will finish on that note. Um, thank you once again for the invitation to participate. Um, and thank you uh, to all of the sponsors who have um, un enabled this webinar to take place. Thank you very much. Much obliged, Rachel, thank you. And uh, shall we move on to our uh, next speaker, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Uh, Hartini Saripan, of the Professor. Thank you, Dr. Fajal. Let me just uh, first share my slides, yeah? I can't share my slide, or do you want to share my slides for me? Okay, thank you so much. Right, hello everyone. I'm Hartini Saripan. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Technology, Mara, Malaysia. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Dr. Bintan, Dean of uh, Fakultas Hukum UPH for inviting me. And uh, I would like to congratulate UPH and uh, all the faculty members on your 25th anniversary. Um, and I really hope that our uh, partnership will continue to flourish um, for many years ahead. Um, and uh, Thank you so much to Dr. Faja. Thank you for your patience in communicating with me. Uh, and I'm very, I'm indeed very honored to be here to share my thoughts. And I hope uh, we're gonna have a very fruitful discussion today. I am not an economist and just now listening to Rachel's presentation enlightened me on so many points uh, connecting with my uh, area of interest uh, that is uh, IT law. And, and I'm very uh, uh, inspired to see how competition law play its role and can be used as one of the tools, you know, in, 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 in uh, recovery. And earlier on, uh, when a uh, uh, professor uh, from uh, Thailand uh, has actually spoken from the perspective of Thailand's uh, experience, I thought that you know, it, it actually came to my mind that in everywhere, this is a global pandemic, we are facing the same issues. So now it's my turn to share my experience. Uh, particularly, I'm going to uh, talk about 
uh, how Malaysia responded to uh, this pandemic. Uh, but first and foremost, I'm going to um, share with you the ASEAN outlook, um, to what extent ASEAN has actually responded uh, to this crisis. Uh, more importantly, I think I'm gonna spend some time on sharing with you the challenges and some of my thoughts um, in uh, uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, last year in one of uh, the OECD's paper, um, they have highlighted that Southeast Asia is facing a rapid growth in the number of confirmed cases. And we are considered as one of the first regions to be affected and impacted by the outbreak. And that is actually very true. So we are now facing not just the prospects of the uh, global financial shock and recession. Some of us are actually experiencing that as a result of economic downturn caused by multiple domestic containment measures and global disruption to certain sectors, including trade, tourism, um, SMEs, uh, MSMEs, uh, services, and production. So to begin with, um, this is actually a crisis like no other. It's very, very unprecedented. Uh, it has turned itself into an unprecedented uncertainty for ASEAN uh, with potentially devastating impact on not just on economy, but also on society. And after expanding so well by an average of 5% over the last decade, for the first time, ASEAN is now uh, experiencing a decline in economic growth in 22 years. And I think this is in line with the uh, ADB, the Asian Development Bank's projection last year, um, which, you know, it revised downward its growth forecast for some of the ASEAN countries uh, from four 0.4% in 2019 to just 1% in 2020. So it's very, very devastating. It's very sad to see this. Uh, next slide, please. So majority of uh, ASEAN member states are expected to experience recession this year. Uh, some has actually uh, experiencing this and, and it could be deeper than others. While some, uh, we are actually experiencing stagnation um, or a much more modest growth. Um, and preliminary data for the first and second quarters of 2020 already point to this possibility. So if you look at to this uh, uh, graph, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines uh, have already experienced double digit contractions in the second quarter of 2020. So it is actually very real that COVID-19 um, has brought down per capita income, has, uh, uh, has actually uh, impacted significantly. And, and we are just not talking about economic impact, but this economic impact has a spillover on the societal impact. Next, please. So if I may share with you some of the devastating impacts, um, significant impacts of COVID-19, um, these are the impacts that have been discussed uh, from the ASEAN perspective. As I mentioned earlier, some has actually experiencing or projected to experience recession. Most have actually experienced stagnation and modest growth in economics. Um, but more interestingly, uh, than this has also been highlighted by the previous speakers, the substantial production uh, disruptions uh, as a result of uh, basically the rapid spread of COVID-19, uh, which is amplified by high mortality rates, have prom prompted a large scale containment policy um, to be put in place uh, globally. And this has in turn led to substantial production disruptions, 
uh, when uh, business uh, businesses were forced to close down and uh, the inability of workers to get to work. Um, and, and, and this has eventually destroyed and disrupt, uh, disrupted trade and businesses. So um, other than that, the pandemic has also uh, underscored and highlighted the vulnerability of uh, supply chains uh, and ASEAN is not excluded from experiencing this. Another point of a significant impact is uh, withering of certain sectors. And we have been listening to this when Rachel highlighted how uh, MSMEs are badly affected. And um, I'm very inspired, as I mentioned, to see how competition law could actually play its role to make sure they are actually, uh, they are still be able to compete um, and play the game. Um, and this is um, also very real that as the virus spread to other countries globally, um, the border control were enforced, social restrictions were enforced in most of the jurisdictions. We have the movement control orders. The regions, travel and tourism, logist logistics and retail sectors um, have actually uh, withered. And we are experiencing this, and uh, in particular for the ASEAN member states that operate their trade and travel sector as their hubs and have high dependency on the tourism sector. And these are the countries among the first ones to suffer the losses from the pandemic. And it's, it's very, very sad to see this. And Malaysia is, is included, of course. Um, and it's very disheartening to see last year in May 2020, uh, we witnessed um, tourists and flight arrivals in, in so many jurisdictions uh, within ASEAN uh, were close to zero. Um, actually, the number has started to pick up in June, uh, but uh, the international borders uh, remain closed. Um, and, and, and I think uh, given the fact that uh, tourism industry is so important for ASEAN economies and, their, and, and also to many enterprises, uh, particularly MSMEs, as well as we have so many informal workers um, and, and, and small industries, COVID-19 has actually impacted um, hugely. Uh, next one is on business. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Next one on the last point of the impact on business closures and retrenchments. Uh, while governments are implementing various policy and stimulus measures to cushion the impact of COVID-19, um, these were not able to prevent business closures and retrenchments. So despite so many economy stimulus packages, we could actually see that quite a number, and, and the numbers are actually rising, and we are experiencing that in Malaysia, um, businesses have started to close down, and we could actually see uh, employees um, uh, have started to face uh, retrenchment processes. Next, please. Right, so given the scale and impact of the pandemic, um, ASEAN has actually recognized uh, that to address the crisis, it requires coordinated actions, not only within the region, but also within its partners, with its partners. Um, the first speaker has actually highlighted the importance of coordinated effort, which I agree um, this point very, very much. And this has been addressed and embraced by ASEAN when they actually come up with the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework uh, to serve as a consolidated exit strategy from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so ASEAN um, is committed to uh, consider collective and long-term socioeconomic recovery strategy alongside with the fact that we have to um, battle uh, this crisis and 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 protect uh, the mankind, protect the the, the public at large. So uh, this comprehensive recovery framework articulates uh, ASEAN's response 
through the different stages of recovery. But what is more important here is that um, via this framework, uh, ASEAN has actually focused on key sectors and segments of society that are mostly affected and, and impacted by the pandemic. And of course, one of the sectors would be uh, travel and tourism, SMEs, uh, services, productions, garments. Um, and they actually set um, a broad strategy, which I'm going to share with you very briefly after this, and identify measures for recovery, which are in line, for, uh, in line with sectoral and regional priorities. Next, please. So since the pandemic is still evolving, uh, ASEAN has actually taken a step to adopt the approach which is uh, to adopt the proactive approach, all encompassing of the approach that uh, uh, able to get inclusion or inclusivity of the whole of community and the approach which, which is flexible and agile um, to be easily adopted um, to changing conditions. And for these, they have actually um, uh, come up with the implementation plan uh, and, and, and uh, set out a, a broad strategies for recovery. There are five strategies for recovery, ranging from enhancing system, uh, health systems. And I think uh, in any jurisdictions, not just in ASEAN, but also in the world, um, enhancing health system is expected to contribute to the short and long-term goals of the ASEAN health sector. Uh, and this is in line with the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. And uh, to achieve these uh, priorities are actually focused on building and sustaining current health gains and measures, maintaining and strengthening essential health services and strengthening vaccine security. Um, it's very interesting to hear um, the first speaker um, uh, enlightening us on the experience of vaccination and immunization process in Thailand, which I believe um, uh, we have been experiencing from that too, Prof. Um, and we really hope that this uh, vaccination or immunization uh, programs uh, is accelerated uh, very, very fast in order to flatten the curve. Uh, secondly, the second strategy is strengthening human security. And ASEAN is very committed to put the welfare of people at the core by strengthening the protection and empowerment of all people and all communities in COVID-19 to recovery and beyond. And um, ASEAN has also admitted the fact that there are actually other factors beyond its health impact uh, that severely impacted uh, us uh, and that goes to the extent of global, glo uh, sorry, human capital uh, accumulation and to overcome these challenges, uh, digital skills, higher education, reskilling and upskilling for employment uh, will be promoted and encouraged. And that actually relates to the next um, broad strategy for recovery of ASEAN that is maximizing the potential of intra-ASEAN market and broader economic integration. So ASEAN has actually um, embraced um, and recognize the fact that uh, to battle against this crisis, we cannot actually work alone. So coordinated efforts uh, must actually uh, be in place um, and, and, and in order, and we have to maximize uh, intra-ASEAN trade and investment in order to strengthen our supply chain resilience and regional value chains. And um, at the moment, um, it is at the rate that we are going now, it is not enough to increase the competitiveness of ASEAN market. So uh, more concerted effort, consolidated work has to be encouraged and work on in order to maximize uh, this potential. Next is the accelerating inclusive uh, digital transformation. And uh, this is actually in line with 
the fact that uh, digital transformation is uh, enormous opportunities presented by digital technologies in order to boost economy and improve society in the post-COVID world. And it is, um, um, it is actually very promising to see how e-commerce has actually kicked off very well um, starting last year. Uh, and we could actually witness how uh, people have actually migrated from brick and mortar businesses to uh, digital and online businesses. And this is a very good sign uh, for ASEAN uh, market uh, because the uh, acceleration needs to take place. Um, and, 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 and I think we have to also admit the fact that we have actually uh, agreed on the importance of uh, digital transformation, but whether we like it or not, COVID-19 has actually accelerated the process. And last but not least, advancing towards a more sustainable and resilient future. So this last uh, strategy of ASEAN is very important uh, to show ASEAN's commitment in, in developing a framework that is not just for a short term, but the framework has to be durable, long lasting, inclusive, capable of safeguarding regions, natural resources uh, and the prosperity of its people. And um, it is uh, also important uh, to admit, and ASEAN has actually recognized and admitted this, uh, that uh, to, uh, the, a return to business as usual may no longer be an option. So we have to um, admit and embrace the fact that there should be a paradigm shift um, and, and it is actually a necessity and a requirement if we want to move forward, particularly if we want to see a takeoff of the uh, economy market in ASEAN. Next, please. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I am very um, delighted to also share with you the Malaysian experience in responding to COVID-19. As a start, um, well, this is as at yesterday, the total confirmed cases um, now is uh, 951,000 plus. Uh, we actually started this in April last year um, with uh, just 4,800 plus. Uh, the first case was detected in, uh, on 25th January last year. And, and by April, 2020, we only have a uh, uh, a death uh, cases of 77 cases, but look at now uh, the number of death toll uh, is approaching 7,500 cases. Um, and if you look, if you look at the uh, uh, national immunization program, um, at the moment we are actually at the at a very reasonable rate. I'm not saying excellent, uh, but some says that this is a good rate. Uh, but we are approaching uh, 46%. We are at the rate of 46% of our immunization program. And uh, by August, the government has actually uh, made an announcement that we're going to accelerate this to 70%. And we really hope that we can get everyone um, vaccinated uh, by end of the year. Um, and, and, and we really hope that this vaccination program is going to be uh, conducted very, very seamlessly and transparent. And, and I uh, understand and agree with the, the first speaker that um, there's, there's a problem with immunization program that requires us to be more transparent in order to make sure that the rate is accelerated. Um, next, please. So if you look at the uh, current situation in Malaysia, um, it is actually true that uh, the Malaysian economy has impact, has been impacted significantly with what is happening now. We managed to flatten the curve last year, uh, but we are actually facing the third wave now and we are in the period and we are now um, uh, in our third uh, lockdown, MCO 3.0. Uh, and some of the states now, uh, we, are, uh, we are actually in the phase of enhanced uh, movement control order uh, in order to 
help uh, to flat flatten the curve and to reduce the number. But uh, these uh, cases has actually impacted our economy quite significantly. Uh, last year, we could actually see the contraction um, uh, by 8%, and that's quite a lot uh, in the first half of 2020. And we could actually see a further decline in the second quarter. And we really hope, uh, because the government has actually uh, announced and initiated so many economic uh, stimulus packages, and we really hope that uh, with all these uh, uh, efforts, you know, we could actually bring back uh, and our economy can actually uh, uh, take a climb uh, this year, uh, despite the high number of cases that we are experiencing now. Next, please. Um, the government has actually um, adopted this strategy for resilient and sustainable growth. Um, and there are six actually strategy um, for this. Uh, resolve, resilient, restart, recover, revitalize and reform. And now we are actually at the uh, revitalize uh, stage uh, where the uh, strategic initiatives of 2021 budget have been declared and this uh, 2021 budget uh, uh, which come with so many uh, stimulus packages strives to strike a balance between addressing the immediate needs of the people and businesses um, and I think now after the third wave of MCO uh, the uh, approach that is taken by a government is different from the first wave of MCO when everything was closed down, but starting the, the second wave of MCO, um, uh, we were under the movement control order with certain uh, uh, sectors uh, were allowed to open. And this is because uh, the government is taking into account the fact that there is a need to balance between health and livelihood. And, and because of that, the uh, 2021 budget has actually emphasizes on few main areas, including uh, caring for people. And we want to also steer the economy. Uh, at the same time, we want to ensure that the efforts uh, are sustainable for sustainable living. And uh, also we want to enhance public service delivery. Next, please. Okay, now, um, Looking at the rate of the crisis, the health crisis in Malaysia, I would like to also share with you some of the legal uh, initiatives, the legal responses that have been uh, put in place. Um, and, and last year we managed to flatten the curve, but this year is a bit challenging. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, legal responses that I put here under the role of law. And law here, um, I actually um, mean uh, soft law as well as hard law. It is not just statutes, but also policy regulations, um, framework. There are, there are basically four main legal responses. One is the imposition of a movement control order. Next is proclamation of emergency, introduction of new law and enforcement of punishment. Next, please. Um, I think this is not just in Malaysia, in most part of uh, the world, as well as in ASEAN, uh, the government has actually imposed the MCO, CMCO. Uh, in Malaysia, we have conditional enhance and recovery depending on the phases of the crisis. And uh, this um, order uh, is derived from the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988. And uh, it, the order includes prohibition on movement and gatherings, mandatory health examination upon arrival in Malaysia, and permission for essential services to operate, among others. Uh, next, please. So these are some of the key highlights of the uh, order during the MCO, as well as the enhanced control order. Um, and few things are actually not lifted up, even though uh, we are in the phase of uh, con uh, conditional as well as recovery uh, in order to restrict uh, our, uh, our 
uh, basically our distancing, our movement um, in order to contain the disease. Next, please. Uh, the next legal response is the proclamation of uh, emergency. And on 12th January 2021, um, His Majesty has actually, uh, the Prime Minister uh, in the statement uh, has actually announced that the King declared uh, a state of emergency uh, following the Prime Minister's announcement on the reimposition of the second lockdown at that time. And this, uh, His Majesty has actually exercised uh, his power under Clause 1 of Article 150 of the Federal Constitution. And according to Article 1501 of the Federal Constitution, it provides that if the King is satisfied that a grave emergency exists whereby the security or the economic life or public order is threatened, he may issue a proclamation of emergency making a declaration to that effect. So Thailand is not alone. Uh, these measures are taken um, and it is aimed at curbing, curbing the recent spike in, in COVID-19 in the country and increasing strain on the country's hospitals and healthcare resources. And we are now still under um, movement control order with uh, certain exceptions to certain states. Next, please. And under this uh, proclamation of emergency, uh, the Parliament and State Legislative Assemblies will not sit until such a time decided by the King. Um, in other words, lawmakers would not be able to make new laws or amend existing laws. Uh, instead, Article 152B of the Federal Constitution provides that the King may promulgate ordinances when a proclamation of emergency is in operation. So several emergency ordinances have been announced to be promulgated, including in relation to the mandatory use of private hospital assets, uh, temporary acquisition of land buildings or private hospitals, movable asset, assets, or the making requests for the use of private hospital resources for the purpose of treating COVID-19 patients. Um, we, it is also um, uh, uh, it is also the fact that um, the ordinance uh, would uh, be um, would be announced to facilitate businesses and overcome any regulations that make it difficult to deliver public health services quickly, effectively, and efficiently. And one of the examples of uh, emergency ordinance uh, is this one, Emergency Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Amendment Ordinance 2021, uh, effective 11 March 2021, where it provides um, a heavier punishment for any individuals who violate SOPs, uh, can be fined up to 10,000 ringgit. Companies and corporations can be fined up to 50,000 ringgit. Before the introduction of this ordinance, uh, the fine was um, 1,000 ringgit for individuals. Next, please. Next is the introduction of new law, which also is seen as economic management uh, by some of the economists. Um, the immediate focus of the government in managing the crisis is on ensuring the safety of the people and addressing the needs of household and businesses adversely affected by the COVID-19. So um, the new act entitled Temporary Measures for Government Financing Coronavirus Disease 2019, COVID-19 2020, was passed in Parliament on 21st September 2020 to finance the stimulus packages. Next, please. So the Act comprises 19 parts. Very quickly, they are divided into three categories. Uh, number one is to address the inability to perform contractual obligation, to modify certain legislation, and to address the inability to perform statutory duties or obligations or to conduct statutory meetings. Next, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think um, it is very important uh, for me to discuss uh, the issues and challenges faced uh, in Malaysia, despite 
the fact that there are so many initiatives, um, so many economic stimulus packages, uh, we are actually facing uh, quite a number of challenges. And these challenges are actually very real, especially this year. Like I said, last year we managed to flatten the curve. This year, it's going to be more challenging. So as Malaysia intensifies uh, our effort to unshakable efforts, um, particularly from the middle income track, um, we actually continue to face several challenges. And one of the main challenges is the uh, drastic decline in economic activities. Um, I have actually mentioned earlier that uh, trade, travel and tourism is one of the main uh, economic enabler, particularly uh, in Malaysia. So um, with uh, so many closure, uh, sorry, with the implementation of MCOs and international uh, uh, borders are being closed uh, to contain the pandemic, um, it is actually have uh, significantly affected our tourism related sectors. And um, I think uh, we hope with the positive rate of vaccination, the tourism industry will, will, will not be facing a bleak near term uh, future. Um, there's a future in, in this industry. At the moment, um, I think since the international borders the, are still closed, um, once the rate of vaccination has accelerated very well, the government is considering to um, uh, find the best strategy to reopen the domestic uh, tourism sector. Another, challenges, uh, another challenge faced uh, by uh, us in Malaysia is food insecurity. So although the government continues to focus on the development of the agricultural sector, food insecurity remains an issue. Um, and uh, uh, some of the factors contributing to this issue is an attractive supply of staple foods, include in, uh, which includes low wages in the agricultural sector, uh, the prevalence of pests and diseases, lack of technology adoption and low interest among the younger generation in the agriculture sector. So we are experiencing this that our young generation may not, you know, uh, be interested in venturing into this uh, sector. Um, and in the long term, uh, this uh, food insecurity may be a significant issue to be dealt with. Next one is limited employment opportunity. Um, it is actually real that um, uh, uh, we are recording double digit rates um, of uh, lower rate, sorry, of higher rate of employability. And uh, this is understandable uh, looking uh, into the fact that some of the sectors are heavily impacted. So employers have to uh, start their retrenchment processes so the value of the employees um, have been revisited and re-evaluated, uh, causing this limited employment opportunity. And uh, other challenges, including regional imbalances, because some states in Malaysia have high uh, capita, high income than the rest, and that actually uh, 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 posed a real challenge to the government to find the right strategy because one size definitely cannot fit all. Um, and uh, the challenge is also to align our effort uh, with the environmental sustainability and sustainable development. Yes, uh, we agree that the SDG, the UN SDG is important. So we are actually uh, looking into what's best to make sure that our efforts are actually aligned with the 17 SDGs. And the rise uh, of cost of living has also uh, impacted um, our people, our, the public significantly in Malaysia. And that is also another challenge for the government to face despite, despite the uh, packages that have been introduced. Lack of digital adoption. Now, despite the fact that I think uh, the study have uh, revealed that 62% uh, of uh, businesses in Malaysia were connected uh, to the internet and 46% subscribed to fixed broadband. 
However, only 18% have a web presence for e-commerce, which means even though uh, Malaysia has quite a good rate of uh, connectivity to the internet to a certain extent, it is also a real challenge to uh, make sure everybody is included uh, to have their web presence for e-commerce. One of the main issue is actually uh, infrastructure, uh, and, and we have uh, quite a huge gap, not really huge, but quite a gap between uh, top 20% and uh, B40, below 40% uh, of the uh, income of the household, of the family household. Um, so this actually has contributed to lack of digital adoption, which in turn, um, uh, again, uh, whatever efforts, uh, one size cannot actually fit all. And that is real challenge. And last but not least, limitation in the logist uh, logistic sectors. Um, logistic industry, including transportation and storage, uh, is actually the one of the main enablers for economic development in Malaysia. Um, and when uh, uh, COVID uh, struck us, uh, Malaysia has uh, has been experiencing from so many issues and there are so many critical dimensions uh, that uh, have actually uh, contributed as a problem, including customs, infrastructure, international shipments, logistic qualities uh, and competence, uh, competencies in tracking uh, and tracing. Next, please. So what is our way forward and how to rise to these challenges, um, especially from the Malaysian perspective? Um, these are some of my thoughts, uh, you know, that we could actually think of, food for thoughts that we can actually discuss. Um, the first one is it is important uh, to uphold the rule of law in fighting COVID-19. Um, I think uh, um, at least all these three speakers, uh, the first and the second speakers, and I am also have highlighted how the law could actually be used as a tool in fighting COVID-19. But we have to also embrace the fact that respecting the law and upholding the rule of law is one of the main challenges and not to mention is one of the significant contributing factors to make sure whatever initiatives that we have put in place um, is being effectively uh, implemented. And when it comes to the rule of law where everybody follows the law regardless who you are, um, I think another fact that we have to also think about is law cannot work in isolation. And I think, you know, COVID-19 really uh, humbly taught us, really taught us a very humble experience for all of us, uh, especially law people, uh, that um, that law cannot actually work in isolation. There are so many governing modalities um, that should actually work together uh, to fight this pandemic. The next one is um, pol pol policing in a time of pandemic. Now, um, the structural reform is needed and that has actually uh, put in place by so many uh, governments in the world, Malaysia is included, and some has actually implemented uh, initiative um, based on a patchwork approach. It may sound a uh, temporary um, reform. Some of the criticisms, you know, they said that a patchwork approach may not be suitable because it will have a temporary effect. Um, structural approach is better. But at the moment, I thought any approach, as long as it works effectively, it should actually be implemented by any local government, by any local jurisdiction. And in Malaysia, I think there's a combination of all these approaches where we could actually see how uh, the enforcement officer have rethink and reimagined their duty is not just to enforce the law, but also to inspire people to enforce the law. I think that is very, very important. Now, the next one is health versus livelihood. Um, we actually experienced this when the government have actually shifted 
the approach of the movement control order, uh, the first movement control order was very, very strict. The second one was different. And the third one following the second one um, have been uh, criticized by some of the general public as uh, inefficient and ineffective. It was not like the first one, but on the other spectrum that we have to think about it is that we have to strike a balance between flattening the curve, that is to uh, regain our health and contain this virus versus the livelihood. Um, I have actually shared with you how our economy is impacted and when the economy is impacted, we, we cannot deny the fact that the society is also uh, facing the spillover and we are actually impacted significantly. So whatever approach that we are taking, I thought that uh, striking a balance between health and livelihood uh, should be taken into account. Um, and this is very, very important. And we have to also strike a balance between uh, businesses, um, uh, merchants, um, employers, employees, and with the introduction of new law, um, the, we hope that you know we would manage to strike a balance. Even though some of the criticism said that the laws, uh, the law was introduced perhaps a little too late uh, because it was introduced in September when we have actually started to face a crisis, and the, the first MCO was in February. But I thought that that is at least a good initiative. Um, and of course, there are so many rooms to be improved. And when we talk about uh, striking a balance, we are talking about the innovative efforts to get our economies back on track. And the initiative by the, the framework set by the uh, ASEAN, I thought is quite useful when they actually targeted um, the sectors uh, that are badly impacted by the pandemic, and we have to be um, uh, strategically correct in choosing which sectors that are impacted. And according to the Asian Development Bank, there are they have identified at least five sectors. Three sectors are actually existing sectors, tourism, agro-processing, and garments. And there are two emerging sectors, and these are the sectors that we could actually venture more uh, to see in what way we could, we could invest in these new growth areas. And these areas are electronics and digital trade. Um, and we have to rethink digital regulation in order to enhance cross-border and digital trade. And to do this, I thought that uh, infrastructure plays an important role. Uh, we actually experienced that in Malaysia, um, that even though we are connected to the internet, sometimes the infrastructure is not that good. Um, we could not actually have our web presence on e-commerce. And last but not least, this is our future. I think co-responsibility, shared responsibility is very important. And when it, when it comes to the pandemic, we have to stop pointing fingers. We have to stop saying that uh, this is not my job, this is your job. Basically, all of us uh, have to work together for our future. Um, and, and many of the challenges that I have actually mentioned today uh, require governments, businesses, citizens, netizens, civil society to work closely together. And with digital transformation uh, becoming more important, I think uh, investing in digital skill would be, would be a necessity. And uh, that would actually accelerate the mechanisms of working together despite the closure of the borders. And working together within Malaysia outside Malaysia, within ASEAN, within our partners, globally, internationally, this is the spirit that actually should be uh, put in place uh, if we really want to see whatever initiatives that we put in place is implemented effectively. Next, please. Okay, next, just pictures. Right, I think the future is being written today. Let's write it together with all of our hearts and our humanity. Next, thank you. And I look forward for a fruitful discussion. Thank you to the sponsors, to the goal sponsors, as well as 
to the silver sponsors. And thank you once again for inviting me. Back to you, Dr. Fajal. Thank you so much, Prof. Now, uh, I would like to, uh, before I turn the time over to uh, Dr. Jose, I, I uh, would like to uh, inform to all of the attendants today that uh, before we uh, have the uh, Q&A session, uh, I'd like to inform that uh, from the committee provides a book voucher from our sponsors, that is uh, Raja Grafindo, uh, for participants who actually address question. And before, and I mean, again, I uh, special thanks to Depot Group, Law Office, uh, Tandra and Associates, and Denton, Sanapia, Pongawa, and Partners. And Dr. Yose, over to you, Pak. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Fajar uh, Sugianto. Um, uh, uh, very good morning uh, to all of you, uh, all uh, distinguished participants uh, of this seminar. Uh, allow me first uh, to congratulate Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pelita Harapan uh, and of course all the faculty members uh, for the 21st anniversary. Um, I believe uh, uh, this anniversary will strengthen the presence of um, FH UPH uh, in participating on human capital development in Indonesia, especially on the, this uh, legal uh, 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 legal aspect, uh, legal and law uh, uh, aspect. Um, I would also like to express my sincere appreciations uh, to invite me and also to provide me an opportunity to share my observation on the uh, on the current critical issue that we are facing uh, at the moment. Allow me also to share my a screen my presentation because I already prepare a presentations. Um, uh, give me one minute. Oops. Give, okay. Uh, I hope you you can see it. Is it okay? Yes, it's good, sir. All of you. All right. Okay. Um. So. Uh, uh, in this uh, 30 minutes, uh, in the next 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to spend uh, uh, the time to talk about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, its impact to the economy, uh, and also the responses. Um, so my daily work is related to economic research, uh, especially on international aspect of the economy. So I will remit of my my presentation and my talk, uh, especially on the uh, economic aspects of the COVID nineteen, the current COVID nineteen, and and uh, I'm not. I mostly discuss the issues at policy level uh, rather than going deep into the regulations and leave the regulatory issues uh, to the hand of the expert here. I believe there are several uh, experts uh, with a legal background that uh, would, that uh, uh, have talked a lot about uh, regulatory issues. Okay, I'm having difficulties actually in looking at my my own slide. Uh, maybe it has to be okay. I, I, I could not see my my slide that I, that I already shared. Hmm. Strange. Uh, because normally I I never had any difficulties here. Uh, hopefully it uh, is it good. Uh, so. Uh, did you see the, the the slide already move? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. This is the outline of my talk this morning. Uh, I will start to look at the current situations on the pandemic issues. Uh, 
uh, in uh, especially in ASEAN countries and the economic impact uh, in the regions before uh, looking at the prospect of economic recovery uh, and the actions that ASEAN and the world uh, need to take during the economic uh, recovery and also the post pandemic era. Again, uh, how to deal with this? <laughs> I'm having difficulties in uh, in dealing with the with the uh, slide. Actually, I don't know. Like I don't know what happens. Maybe like because because the arrangement uh, there. Uh, would you like us to assist you on that? By you say. Yeah, but I already changed a, a little bit of my slide that I shared before. Um, okay, let let me let me do it. Probably you can turn it off again. Uh, turn it off first, then try it again, sir. Uh, turn turn what? Sorry. Uh, stop the share screen and try okay. It again. All right, and then try again. Try again, or like this. Okay. Oh, uh, oops. Oh, screen sharing has stopped. Let <laughs> uh, uh, me. Yeah. All right. I hope uh, I hope it work. Uh, as as uh, as we know that the pandemic in the region is not over yet, since uh, many countries are actually entering a new wave of, of COVID cases, uh, and uh, even more even more worrying actually that the the fatality rate uh, in um, many countries are actually still high. Uh, like in Indonesia uh, and in Malaysia, uh, oh, sorry, in Philippines, while uh, some other countries uh, start witnessing an increasing patterns uh, of this um, uh, of the fatality rate. So um, uh, we we're still far from over, uh, although uh, fortunately we uh, actually already have. Uh, the, the way to handle the issues, uh, the key uh, to handle this pandemic issue is, is actually uh, by having uh, wider vaccinations and wide coverage of vaccination. Unfortunately, countries in the uh, 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 countries in the region face two difficult situations at the moment. Uh, the first one is the coverage of vaccination is still low, uh, and also the pace of the vaccination uh, program is still low. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, we also uh, start to question the effectiveness of the vaccine, which uh, uh, relatively the one that available uh, in the region, in ASEAN countries, uh, perhaps uh, a, a, bit slow, uh, a bit low compared to other countries available in, uh, in other uh, part of the world. Yeah. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, in addition to the, the health issues, of course, we also know that the, the pandemic uh, already, uh, already uh, gave us uh, an, uh, an economic crisis uh, due to disruptions in uh, all aspects of the economy. Uh, uh, and the prolonged pandemic and health issues that currently we are facing also jeopardized the prospect of the economic recovery. The pandemic has disrupted uh, both all aspects, both domestically and cross-border. Uh, this has resulted to the situation that many observers uh, even call as the worst recession in several decades. Uh, uh, the last time that uh, the current, the our region uh, uh, suffered uh, disruptions uh, this big uh, was in 1998 during the ASEAN financial crisis. But the uh, so uh, after after more than 20 years, we now have the deepest recession in uh, in several decades. In other part of the uh, the world, uh, the, uh, the 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 current recessions uh, can also be compared 
for uh, the the worst recessions during the last uh, 40 or, or, or more than four decades. Um, of course, the uh, the the the, the situation in uh, in ASEAN countries uh, actually a little bit better uh, if we compare it to other uh, other part of the world, uh, but still the long term effect would leave the scar into the economic performance uh, of the region. One area that has been hit badly uh, in economic uh, uh, is the economic relation and connectivity uh, in the region. Uh, we ha we have seen that the uh, trade in the region has been uh, dwindling quite significantly. Uh, the, before the pandemic, actually, the the uh, the trade contributed to around sixty percent uh, of uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, GDP. Um, in the early period of the pandemic trade in the region fell by, uh, by more than 20%. Uh, although some countries uh, have actually revived uh, their situations, uh, but, uh, but still uh, the risk of uh, having, uh, having another disruptions uh, in the, uh, on trade is still, uh, is still quite high. It also disrupted global and regional supply chain that put production in many countries into a suspension. Uh, countries uh, also seems to resort on protectionist trade policies and regulation, <clears throat> including also uh, in Southeast Asia. Yeah, as we have see, uh, seen that some some countries in uh, uh, Southeast Asia also um, uh, already put some protectionist measure. <clears throat> uh, although uh, compared to other countries, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> compared to other part of the world the trade, pro, uh, trade protectionism <clears throat> seems to be uh, 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 quite under control uh, in this region. Um, but uh, still we've seen that trade, uh, trade protectionist measures increase quite significantly, especially on protective and medical equipment, as well as uh, on what medications. Uh, some food producers uh, in the region also increase the export restrictions uh, to their exported product. <clears throat> so uh, the, the current new wave of cases uh, actually make the prospect of recovery become more distant uh, since countries in the region uh, need to implement uh, stricter containment measures uh, that prevent um, people mobility. Although some economic uh, activities can now be facilitated uh, to digital platform through digital platform, but many other economic activities need, uh, still need to have uh, uh, intensive um, people mobility, both for uh, domestic and international uh, economy. Uh, uh, as you can see here, the economic uh, the uh, people mobility has been uh, reduced uh, uh, quite significantly during the last uh, two or three months. Uh, in in the region, and it uh, of course it would affect the the uh, it would affect the economic activities, and also it would affect uh, the economic performance, uh, and may also jeopardize uh, uh, the prospect of economic recovery. I just um, uh, I just uh, publish my my study on the uh, uh, on the uh, people mobility and the economic performance uh, and the correlations between uh, between those uh, two uh, those uh, two aspects the uh, people mobility and economic performance is very very significant uh, so so we can we can expect that uh, uh, the current containment measure that has been uh, placed in in several other uh, uh, several countries in the regions would also affect the prospects of economic uh, co uh, recovery. Uh, of course, uh, it also uh, it, uh, it, uh, the uh, people mobility would not only affect the uh, domestic economic recovery, but also would uh, uh, affect the especially affect the international uh, uh, economic aspect. Uh, like we can see here, the number of uh, visitors 
the number of visitor arrival uh, uh, in many Southeast Asian countries is still very, uh, very low. Uh, the pandemic hit tourism in Asia, in, in Southeast Asia abruptly and deeply. Uh, and it may take years to recover, but uh, we uh, still need to find some way in order uh, for uh, this uh, people mobility, especially the cross-border mobility, uh, can have some kind of adjustment and uh, accelerate the recovery. So in, in the wake of the pandemic, uh, actually we face three uh, triple issues, triple related issues. The first one is the health problem. Uh, the, the second one, the economic recovery. Uh, and the third one is the long-term uh, post-pandemic uh, issues. Here, I try to list the necessary action that we need to reconsider uh, 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 in the short-term period, in the medium terms, uh, and also in the longer uh, term uh, uh, period. Um, this is not intended to be an exhaustive list, ex uh, exhaustive list but uh, perhaps it will give direction for further discussions uh, when we're talking about uh, e economic recovery and also to look at the post-pandemic uh, era. Um, I'm not going to discuss all of this uh, aspect here, but maybe I would like to highlight uh, several of them. Uh, on the short term, uh, I think I need to underline the importance of vaccine production and distributions, because this is going to be the key for a strong uh, and faster economic recovery. Um, uh, uh, I also would like to, uh, related to the vaccinations, I also would like to highlight that we also need to have some modification and adjustment, especially in the WTO trips uh, and al uh, also other IP related regulation, because it might also help uh, the pro, uh, uh, not only help production and distribution of vaccine, but it would be, uh, uh, it would be, uh, uh, it would be supported, supportive in dealing with the new variants of COVID case. One aspect is on data transparency and data sharing. The more data transparency on the effectiveness and also the uh, the the, the mechanism uh, work mechanism of the vaccine uh, and greater data sharing between between uh, all, all stakeholders would have vaccine improvement that is is becoming more important given the current emergence of, of the new variants of uh, COVID nineteen. So. Now I will spend some time to talk about uh, some issues on uh, at the me me um, medium and also long term uh, uh, period. Um, uh, in the medium terms, uh, at least two issues need more attention. The first one uh, is related to the macroeconomic and financial sectors. Uh, we need to find an approach. Uh, appropriate exit strategy from this pandemic economy. As we know that during the pandemic, the economy actually depends heavily on fiscal intervention uh, and also government support. Uh, uh, while it is of course necessary to support the economy, uh, it cannot be done continuously. Uh, it already put pressure to fiscal and debt risk of many countries, especially the, the developing and emerging countries, such as uh, uh, countries in Southeast Asia. Um, and the recent new wave and limited vaccination coverage in many developing countries actually also lead to uneven recovery, uh, where the, uh, the recovery only takes place in more developed countries, while the recovery has been delayed in many developing countries, such as uh, the countries uh, in Southeast Asia, ASEAN member countries. Um, and this actually increases the risk from a financial crisis. Um, perhaps I should say, uh, I should also mention that we are uh, actually quite lucky because during the one and a half year, uh, we do have economic disruptions. The, the disruptions still uh, contain or isolated in the real sector, uh, while the financial sector uh, relatively remain unaffected. 
However, if these two issues, the the debt uh, the debt risk uh, and also the uh, the risk from uneven recovery would continue, then we are going to see uh, the financial crisis is also under pressure. Uh, and if the financial crisis takes place due to those uh, those debt issues and uh, uneven recovery, uh, the situation in Southeast Asian car- Uh, countries uh, in ASEAN countries will be much worse than the than the current uh, situation. Yeah. That's the first uh, the first issue that we need to pay attention, especially uh, during uh, during uh, this recovery era. Uh, and the the um, the second issues that I would like also to highlight in the medium term is on the connectivity uh, issue, uh, connectivity aspect. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, connectivity is uh, uh, one of the badly hit uh, during the pandemic era. So we need to find way for safe and efficient travel arrangement. Uh, we also need to keep away uh, protectionism of, uh, from being in, being uh, being implemented in the uh, in the uh, in the region uh, and. Uh, and in addition, uh, we also need to uh, uh, we also need to think about how to uh, rearrange our uh, global and regional supply chains. During the pandemic, uh, the 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 one of uh, one of the issues, uh, especially uh, in the early uh, period of the pandemic, uh, our supply chain uh, in the reg- uh, in the region and also globally uh, w- uh, was disrupted quite significantly. That's because the uh, the current arrangement or uh, put too much dependency only on a few hubs that make the supply chain itself vulnerable to shocks you can see in the uh, in the figure uh, on the right figure the portion of imports that come from china as a percentage of total import in 2019 uh, most of the countries in the region for example uh, rely a lot on the uh, uh, on the imports from china especially for uh, productions uh, in their countries uh, and uh, this have heavy dependency Uh, uh, it's not really in line with the uh, economic uh, economic resistance uh, uh, and resilience, uh, including also in the production uh, and uh, investment and trade. So those actions, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the one that I think uh, I deem quite uh, quite uh, uh, quite necessary uh, is the, on the. Um, fiscal issues, uh, fiscal and macroeconomic issues, uh, and also uh, the, uh, the connectivity revitalization uh, need to take place uh, uh, sooner than later. But they cannot be done unilaterally. Uh, the pandemic only ends anywhere if we can end it everywhere. Uh, fiscal and debt issues should also be dealt in a concentrated efforts. Uh, reviving connectivity also need greater cooperation between countries. So th- that's why we need greater uh, international economic cooperations in dealing with all those uh, issues. Uh, there have been many proposals actually uh, to improve uh, international cooperation in fighting the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, uh, e- even some Uh, uh, in in fact, some uh, forums uh, such as uh, ASEAN, uh, as early as April to twenty uh, twenty, already came up with commitments to work together uh, in managing the pandemic uh, and also to prepare the regional economy in dealing with the consequences. Uh, ASEAN. Plus three, for example, uh, in April twenty twenty, during their uh, summit. A special summit on COVID-19 uh, made commitment to st- to strengthen uh, the uh, and to work together uh, on the health issues. ASEAN Plus Three also already made commitment uh, to strengthen the existing regional uh, re- regional sef- uh, financial safety nets uh, in, in the case that uh, uh, pressures on the international. 
uh, financial sectors uh, will increase. Uh, the, the ASEAN Plus 3 uh, has the so the so-called Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateral, uh, uh, normally is called uh, CMIM, where 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 uh, those countries uh, contribute together uh, in the case of financial crisis. However, uh, those initiatives uh, and commitments from ASEAN country uh, seem a little bit pale to the magnitude uh, of the problem. Yeah. Um, because because the, the, the problem uh, seems to be uh, seem to be very high and very significant and we need a greater cooperation. Uh, ASEAN, uh, as well as other forums, including uh, G20, for example, the forum of uh, 20 largest economies in the world, uh, found that uh, those various uh, commitments are actually uh, difficult to implement. It is easy for them to, to find uh, the to to agree with the commitment but well but uh, in uh, in uh, when it comes to the uh, implementation there are many uh, issues that uh, that delay or that hinder the implementations uh, successfully uh, even if the commitment could be implemented uh, the pace seems to be inadequate uh, often leads to delayed inter uh, necessary interventions and The problem actually can be traced uh, into at least four uh, factors, uh, ranging from an, uh, from national interests uh, that uh, often often not in line with the uh, with the greater uh, uh, um, uh, regional or global interests. Uh, also, lack of trust. Uh, mostly also because of the geopolitical tensions it also happens here in the regions especially during uh, especially because we uh, we've seen that the the pandemic did not really uh, deter did not really reduce the tension between the US and China but uh, it uh, it uh, also uh, Uh, it's also multiplied or uh, even increased that uh, the the magnitude of these geopolitical tensions uh, another issue is all, uh, another important issue is technical issues such as lack of mechanism when uh, asean and the dialogue partners uh, in asean plus 3 came up with commitment and plan of actions uh, april last year to uh, fight and to do uh, Uh, to do some things on the uh, health issues, uh, 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 those initiatives, those uh, action have to be conducted by ad hoc forces that consist of official from member countries. Uh, ASEAN or other forums basically do not have specialized organization to deal with health issues. Uh, uh, well, uh, in fact, actually, ASEAN do do not really have many. Uh, specialized organization or institution that can be uh, deployed uh, 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 in order to deal with with uh, uh, with cert uh, certain issues. So uh, it is about time, actually, for uh, ASEAN to consider establishing uh, several uh, relevant specialized institution and organization. So in case that uh, the actions need to be taken. Those specialized institution or organizations uh, can also be deployed, uh, and the, the commitment from the, the countries can be done and can be conducted in more successful uh, and effective way. However, of course, uh, we should also give credits uh, to the uh, to countries in these regions, uh, especially to ASEAN, because uh, it, it, it uh, last year. It, It has successfully pushing the agenda of having open and inclusive regional arrangement through the establishment of RCP. Uh, this is not only a trade agreement among ASEAN and uh, its uh, six partners, but it also uh, a strong signal from the region uh, to the world that these countries remain committed to an open economy uh, and integration agenda and would keep uh, the protectionism aside uh, in the future. So 
my point here uh, in my uh, presentation is that uh, uh, countries uh, in the region in Southeast Asia and also greater uh, greater region of Asia uh, should pursue greater cooperation um, and overcome the difficulties they're uh, facing so far. Um, regional and international cooperation is not only necessary for fighting the pandemic and to support the economic recovery that is currently uh, we are having at the moment, uh, but it would also be, uh, be needed in the post-pandemic era because uh, it would be unlikely that we are going back to the situation before uh, the pandemic. Um, there would be many new things many new ways to conduct economic activities that need more uh, greater uh, cooperation and greater attention uh, in the future. In the post-COVID, post-pandemic era, uh, we need to take care of at least uh, three issues. Uh, there are actually, they are not new, uh, but the magnitude have, has been increasing uh, during uh, this pandemic. The first one is uh, digital disruption. Yeah. The, digital, uh, the digital technology uh, uh, already provide us a lot uh, during uh, this pandemic era. Uh, the, the pandemic uh, teach us that uh, digital technology over a lot of opportunities, uh, including also to, uh, to support inclusive development. Yeah. But it also poses uh, some downs downsides. Uh, such as the need for new sets of skills, uh, the new arrangements of uh, labor and employer relation, uh, or uh, also uh, and also the need for new sets of international rules and disciplines. How uh, the taxations be implemented in this uh, in this uh, digital era? B because many. Uh, uh, a provider, many services provider, for example, do not really uh, uh, located in the uh, in the same place uh, than uh, uh, with the consumer. So it would be uh, uh, be more difficult to tax those service providers uh, for the government. There, there, there should be more a uh, new kind of management. Uh, including also government management uh, in dealing with this digital transformation. The second issue, or the second, uh, the second, uh, the second issue that we need to pay more attention in the post-pandemic era, is to ensure that the recovery is of high quality and sustainable. It means that the recovery should be enjoyed by all. Uh, parties or uh, uh, all stakeholders in the society. Uh, it also need to contribute to our global agenda of fighting climate change and preserving uh, uh, environment. Uh, and it also need to be supported by structural reforms. Otherwise, the, uh, the, the, our recovery is, uh, would not be sustainable uh, and uh, it would only be enjoyed by a certain parts of the society and would not be, uh, would not uh, become a, 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 an equitable development. It, it but uh, uh, related to that, it is uh, uh, it is very unfortunate as uh, actually that the the pandemic and crisis also already uh, put uh, a, a halt in the in the realizations of uh, sustainable development in the region. This is the 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 achievement uh, of countries in Southeast Asia uh, with related to the. the to the targets of sustainable development goals of 2030. Uh, during the pandemic era in 2020, uh, some aspect has, has even uh, regressed, while other only progress uh, a little bit during the, uh, 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 during the year. So there would be a lot of uh, homework for us uh, to deal with this issue. The third uh, issue that I would like to highlight here for the post-pandemic era is how to come up with a new set of economic order uh, and arrangement. Uh, the digital transformation, climate change, 
geopolitical ten, uh, rising geopolitical tensions and also uh, demographic changes require us to rethink and reformulate new set of rules and discipline especially on international trade uh, on investment international investment on international production uh, and uh, also services but also uh, on uh, international financial sector in institution most of the uh, the rules and uh, and disciplines uh, was written uh, in the uh, the 20th century already more than 25 years ago uh, and it might not be um, uh, suitable for the uh, recent uh, developments uh, the recent international economic development especially when uh, when the pandemic actually pushed Uh, that uh, the the changes uh, push uh, those adjustments uh, in a, uh, in more significant way. So those kind of issues, uh, the the current one, the short term and the long term, uh, medium and long term uh, uh, issues, need to be handled at global level as well as at the regional level, uh, since it uh, would involve a lot of cross border. And global characteristic that cannot be uh, attained, cannot be managed by only uh, one or several countries. So, let me uh, conclude my presentation actually to uh, in by highlighting the role of uh, ASEAN that has a strategic position uh, to play greater role in promoting greater international cooperation. And this international cooperation uh, is really re uh, needed for the uh, successful recovery and also uh, beyond the pandemic era. Um, ASEAN leaders uh, need to put more effort, uh, serious effort to push for greater international cooperation. Uh, with that, I conclude my uh, presentations. Uh, I'm very happy to discuss uh, all those issues further. Uh, and uh, hopefully we would learn more uh, uh, in the discussion. Thank you very much. I give it back to you, uh, Pak Fajar. Thank you, Pak Yose. Uh, for the next and the very last speaker, uh, uh, Pak Dian. Over to you, Pak. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pak Fajar. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fajar Sugianto, as the moderator. And first of all, I would like to congratulate the law faculty of UPH for the 25th anniversary. May God bless and also prosper for the next future. And first of all, I would like to convey warm, warm greetings to all panelists, as your professor of Foreign Chai Vichutisa, as your professor Hartin Saripan, and also Mrs. Rachel Burgess and Dr. Yose Rizal Damuri. Thank you for your, for your enlightenment for all of us. For today, allow me to convey a proposals as the improvement for the emission competition law. The title of my presentation is the role of the emission competition law and KPPU in supervising partnership agreement to accelerate the recovery of MSMEs from the COVID-19 for FADIS. So this is actually a question for the Indonesian Competitions Authority and also for the KPPU, how they can solve the crisis, especially that affected the SMEs because of the COVID-19. Next, please. So the COVID-19 has two detrimental effects to Indonesia. The first is the health crisis. As the last report from the GSIS, there has been increase of the mortality rate in Indonesia. Indonesia is the, one of the highest country suffered from the mortality rate because of the COVID-19. Uh, next, please. And not only has caused the health crisis, but also COVID-19 has economic crisis in Indonesian economy. 
Um, pardon me, Pak Yose, uh, I believe that you're more familiar with this data, but uh, from the economic perspective, the COVID-19 has affected deeply the economic in Indonesia, especially in tourism industry. Why I spotlight the tourism industry? Because most of the small and medium enterprises, uh, they are involved in tourism service industry. So approximately 90% uh, of the small and medium enterprises are engaged in tourism service industry in Indonesia. So this is very crucial for the Indonesian government to take uh, rapid measures to solve the crisis in tourism industry. From my point of view, why the crisis in Indonesia uh, prolonged until now? Because uh, there are extensive informality in the uh, uh, small medium enterprises, uh, lack of skills and low social security coverage, and also the slow responsiveness of the central and local governments against the ever increasing pandemic. So the key is the quick response to solve the crisis. Next, please. The government of Indonesia has actually carried out several key responses to mitigate and also to prevent or to minimize the risk of the COVID-19. If we take a look, there are at least five actions that the government have conducted. The first one is the government issued a key regulations uh, similar with Thailand and Malaysia experience and also Australia. There is a health emergency law that is issued in end of March last year. And this law has authorized the special task force on COVID-19 or Satgas COVID-19 and in overall, a rapid increases in COVID-19 are also cause high mortality in Indonesia. Although the government have imposed lockdowns and so-called as PSBB or large social restrictions, however, the citizens have not complied with the government rules and instructions. This is the drawbacks of the uh, Indonesian response to COVID-19. The government must impose uh, severe penalties to the people who are stubborn and who are not willing to the government instructions. As regards to the economic stimulus for the small and medium enterprises, the government has issued the third stimulus package in end of March last year, and this economic stimulus was targeted at the small medium enterprises. For example, <laughs> relaxations of financial loans and also for the small and medium enterprises. Next slide, please. I would like to bring you to the real situations of the small and medium enterprises in Indonesia because they are actually the most important economic sectors in Indonesia from my point of view. So according to the National Statistic Bureau or BPS, in last year, there are 64 million of small and medium enterprises registered in Indonesia. So there are a lot of small and medium enterprises that are distributed in 33 provinces around Indonesia. As a matter of fact, the small and medium enterprises have been the prominent employment creator in Indonesia, in particular for women and low-skill workers. And therefore, small and medium enterprises constitute a crucial and strategic component of Indonesia national economic development. Because most of the women, uh, do, they do not have uh, high skills and also with the children. So small and medium enterprises become their primary incomes for daily livings. If you take a look, based on the BP, uh, 
GPS data, SMEs or small medium enterprises has contributed approximately 99% to the Indonesian national economy. So this is according to the latest KPPU report. Next, please. Now we take a look the real situations suffered by the small medium enterprises because of the COVID-19. Over than 150,000 of small medium enterprises in Indonesia have been negatively affected by the COVID-19 through the reduced income because of the lockdowns and also difficulties in obtaining raw materials and also financial assistance. Such use and continuous reductions of incomes for the small medium enterprises may ultimately lead to the closures of the small and medium enterprises or their businesses being acquired by larger players, for example, by Shopee or by Tokopedia. Indeed, over more than 72.6% of the small medium enterprises suffer from dropout of orders, difficulty of distributions, and difficulty to obtain raw materials. It is estimated that only 50 until 70% of emission small and medium enterprises can survive during the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore the government have made an intermediate policy last year. The government has encouraged the small medium enterprises to go digital. Why? Because 26% of increase in business transactions take place in e-commerce transactions. Therefore, the Indonesian government encourage the small medium enterprises to transform their businesses and also their transactions into the e-commerce platform. It seems this is a quick solution. However, there is another problem for this go digital policy. Uh, next slide, please. I have identified the problems for the small medium enterprises because of the go digital policy. Namely, without the competition law provided for the small medium enterprises, there is a risk that the monopolistic situations may arise. For those small medium enterprises that are able to move online, there is a huge risk that that the incumbent e-commerce digital companies such as Shopee or Tokopedia can arbitrarily impose unfair business practices against the small medium enterprises because they have strong economic power or so-called as dominant position in the market. For example, I give you one example of this unbalance between the small medium enterprises and digital companies. Because of the market leverage of the digital companies and the positions of big data by digital companies like Shopee, they can indeed dominate both of the upstream and downstream markets in Indonesia. Therefore, they can impose high entry barriers against the small medium enterprises in Indonesia. For example, we have heard recently that Tokopedia have merged with Gojek. And Gojek have also thousands of business partners and majority of them are small medium enterprises. So what is the problem with the positions of big data by the Shopee, for example, and also other big digital companies? According to the German Competition Authority or Bundeskartalam, Based on their report, they argue that the big data is also facilitate the price discriminations against the consumers 
and also against the small medium enterprises. Provided that it has market power, the big digital company will then be able to use that information or the big data to set different prices for the different customers groups it has identified thanks to the data collected. So the ownership of big data of the big companies has indeed become so-called as the essential facilities that can be at any time be used by the, for example, by Shopee to impose price discriminations against the small medium enterprises. Next, please. This is the examples how the big uh, digital companies like Shopee impose uh, the big data to dominate the market. So Shopee has a thousands or millions of consumers and they cluster the data of the consumers into three types based on the volume, velocity and the variety. And they make a clustering of prices and make the price algorithm algorithm based on this big data. By definitions, big data is large amounts of different types of data generated at high speed from multiple sources whose handling and analysis requires new and more powerful processors and algorithms. So this is the key instrument for the big digital companies to dominate the market in Indonesia in spite of the go digital policy by the Indonesian government. Next slide, please. The second question to the ownership of big data by Shopee, for example, when the big data can be a domination to market in Indonesia. According to the German Competition Authority, ownership of big data by digital companies like Shopee can constitute a market entry barriers for small medium enterprises and increase the market power of digital company if access to data, which is specific and very essential, for a business actor to compete and dominate a certain market. Third factor, another competitor cannot acquire the access to specific data either individually or through the third party assistance. This is totally correct for the admission small medium enterprises. They cannot access the data and they cannot collect the data individually because the big digital companies like Shopee or Tokopedia, they have outsourced a third or independent company to provide and to collect big, da big data of consumers to become their assets and their essential facilities to impose dominance in the market. Next slide. Last time, the head of the Indonesian Supervisory Committee for Business Competition, or KPPU, has made a strong statement against the dominations by big digital company. I provide in Bahasa, but the key message by the chairman of KPPU, Pak Kurat Wibowo, that he argues that the online platform in Indonesia can discriminate small medium enterprises and also can have detrimental effects to the small medium enterprises because of the go digital policy. Because there is no level of playing field or equal level of playing field between the small medium enterprises and big digital companies. Therefore, KPPU argues there must be a strong supervision by KPPU to prevent and to mitigate any abuse of power 
by the big digital companies against the small medium enterprises. Uh, next slide, please. KPPU work through the Indonesian competition law, law number no. five, 1999. Although this is a quite obsolete or quite uh, old law, however, this law provides actually uh, three instruments to prevent or to mitigate any misuse of power or abuse of power against the small medium enterprises. First, there is prohibitions against negotiating strategy, for example, cartels between digital companies like Tokopedia and Shopee. And the second instrument, there are rules on obstructions or impediment strategy. For example, when Shopee impose boycott against the small medium enterprises or price discriminations. And the third instrument by the Indonesian competition law is provisions on conglomerations and concentration strategy. So the third instrument is aimed to prevent the dominant positions by digital companies that could lead to the abuse of dominant positions. For example, if Tokopedia has become the primary digital companies in Indonesia, of course, inevitably, Tokopedia is susceptible to abuse its power, for example, by imposing price differentiations or conglomerations. This is very possible because of the digital companies have also network effects that make them easy to enlarge their companies. Uh, next slide, please. Now I would like to invite you to analysis on supervising of partnership agreement. Because of the go digital policy by the Indonesian government that small medium enterprises must transform their businesses into the e-commerce platform. Of course, there will be a risk that there will that the small medium enterprises will be misused or will be cheated by the big digital companies. Therefore, the KPPU has prescribe a rules for the supervisions of partnership agreement or we call as kemitraan, perjanjian kemitraan. The Indonesian Commission for the Supervisions of Business Competitions or the KPPU has issued the regulations number 4, 2019 on the proceedings for the supervisions and handling of partnership disputes. The KPPU scopes includes the supervisions of partnership agreements between firstly, micro, small and medium enterprises and large scale enterprises. And secondly, between micro and small scale enterprises and medium scale enterprises. There is a danger in the first type of supervisions, namely, partnership be between micro, small, and medium enterprises with large-scale enterprises. Because from my point of view, to what extent KPPU can enforce in its sanctions against large-scale enterprises, for example, like Shopee or Tokopedia. It is a dilemma for KPPU to impose antitrust sanctions against large-scale enterprises. So this is just questions for KPPU in the future. If we take a look at the substance of the KPPU regulations on partnership agreements, KPPU is authorized to provide at least eight types of partnerships. The first type is the plasma core partnerships that is mostly between 
uh, the farmers of palm oil that is majority in Indonesia. Second type is subcontract partnerships. Third type is franchise partnerships. Fourth type is distributions and agency. Fifth type is profit sharing businesses. Six types is operation corporations. Seven type is outsourcing and other types of partnerships. So these eight sectors of partnerships belongs to the authority of KPPU to supervise. From my point of view, KPPU has not sufficient capacity or resources to conduct supervision in all these eight sectors because there will be intersections of authority with other ministries. For example, with the Ministry of Small and Medium Enterprises and Cooperative. So therefore, it is necessarily important that KPPU cooperate with the Ministry of Small and Medium Enterprises to supervise partnership agreement. Next slide, please. If you take a look at the contents of the supervision agreement, I mean, uh, supervision of partnership agreement by the KPPU, there are several legal basis for this authority for KPPU. The first legal basis is the Article 34, Paragraph 2, Law Number 820, Year of 2008, regarding micro, small, and medium enterprises. It said that the partnership agreement, as intended in paragraph one, may not be contradictory to the Brexit principles of independence of the small medium enterprises and shall not create dependence or high dependence of the micro, small, and medium enterprises, upon large enterprises like Shopee or Tokopedia. Specifically, Article 36 of the law number 20. 2008 on partnership agreement, the court's authority to KPPU to supervise partnership agreements. It said that the implementations of partnership agreement shall be supervised in an orderly and regular manner by institutions established and serving to supervise business competitions as provided for in laws and regulations. So what is this authority that is the KPPU? So based on the article 36 of the law number 20, KPPU has already obtained the single authority to supervise partnership agreement around Indonesia. If you take a look at the another regulations, namely the government regulations number 70 years of 2003, regarding the implementations of the law number 20 on partnership agreements, these government regulations provide more clear and detailed provisions. It said that KPPU shall supervise the implementations of partnership agreement as intended in Article 10, Paragraph 1, and in accordance with the provisions of laws and regulations. In conducting supervisions as intended in paragraph one, KPPU shall establish coordinations with related agencies. And third paragraph, provisions regarding supervisions, proceedings as intended in paragraph one shall be provided in KPPU regulations. However, there is a problem with these regulations. Up until now, there has been no clear regulations, especially how KPPU make uh, coordinations with related ministries or agencies. And I'm of firm op op opinion that KPPU will not be able to carry out these supervisions of partnership agreements by using its own resources because it has at least X sectors in Indonesia that must be supervised by KPPU. Okay. Next slide, please.
If you take a look at the practice of the partnership agreements between small and medium enterprises with big digital companies like Shopee or Tokopedia, actually it is quite complicated. And therefore, KPPU must have sophisticated regulations to supervise these partnership agreements because there are many business strategies by the big digital companies to impose price discriminations or dominant market against the small medium enterprises. There are two substance that, that becomes the key in partnership agreement that must be supervised by KPPU. The first type is the ownership. And the second type is controlling. KPPU must be able to supervise these two kinds of connections between small medium enterprises and big digital companies. First type, namely the ownership, KPPU must supervise carefully if there is a majority ownership by the big digital companies like shares equity or tangible and intangible assets. And second type, KPPU must supervise if there is a controlling practices by the big digital companies. What is the meaning of controlling? Controlling is defined or take place when there is a direct or indirect uh, control or exercise of influence by the big digital companies towards the small medium enterprises in three types of actions. The first type is controlling to the voting rights Second types, controlling to agreements. And third types is controlling to terms of trade. For example, if I become one of the small medium enterprises and I would like to market my products in e-commerce platform, I will try to use Shopee, for example. But as a layman, I could not understand exactly what are the terms of trade in the electronic contract that I signed with Shopee? As far as I know, most of the most of the uh, partners in Shopee or Tokopedia, they didn't read the terms of trade in electronic contract with Shopee or Tokopedia. So this could lead to the controlling effects by the big digital companies against the small medium enterprises. According to the law on partnership agreement, the law on partnership agreement prohibits any proxy. What is the meaning of proxy? Proxy means when there is a controlling by the big digital companies towards the small medium enterprises and this proxy is contrary to the following principles. The first principle is mutual needs. Second principle is mutual trust. Third principle is mutual strengthening or uh, encouragement. And fourth type is mutual benefits. From my point of view, it would be very challenging task for KPPU to inspect and to analyze if there is a violations against the principles of mutual needs, mutual trust, and mutual benefits between small medium enterprises and big digital companies. Again, KPPU does not have sufficient resources 
to supervise partnership agreements if they have to rigorously analyze the controlling practices by the big digital companies like Shopee. Of course, KPPU must inspect if there is a exploitative practices or there will there is a benefits only for what one side practices in the partnership agreement between the big digital companies and small medium enterprises in Indonesia. So this is a challenge for KPPU as well as the Indonesian competition law. How to comprehensively and rigorously supervise and to prevent any abuse of power in partnership agreement between small medium enterprises and big digital companies like Tokopedia and Shopee. At present, there is a draft of the new Indonesian competition law at the Indonesian parliament. However, there has been almost more than three years that this draft law is still discussed in the parliament. And we are waiting actually for the enactment of this new law of competition law, especially the regulations for supervising of partnership agreement. So in my conclusions, I found several problems with the KPPU and also the Indonesian competition law in terms how they could effectively supervise the partnership agreements of the small mid enterprises. The first problem is there is vacuum of regulations concerning the regulations of big data by the big digital companies. To what extent that the big digital companies can misuse the big data to impose price discriminations against the small medium enterprises in Indonesia. Second type of problems, there is no clear regulations regarding how to assess the market power of the big digital companies. At present, KPPU has only regulations to assess the traditional market power, namely when buyer and seller meet at the market. But KPPU does not have any clear regulations regarding the market power in digital platform. And the third type of problems, KPPU has not issued a uh, sophisticated regulations concerning how to supervise partnership agreements. KPPU regulations number four, 2019, only provides the proceedings for handling the cases of partnership agreements. But that is a curative approach. What about with the preventive approach of KPPU? Do KPPU have clear regulations to prevent any abuse of dominant positions by the big digital companies like Shopee against the small medium enterprises. This has become a challenge for the KPPU and also the emission competition law. How to comprehensively and accurately regulate the supervisions of partnership agreements between small and medium enterprises and big digital companies. My hope is that through the enactment of the new regulations by KPPU and also by the Indonesian government to issue as quickly as possible the new uh, Indonesian competition law, this could help and support the small medium enterprises to get a safeguard for the small medium enterprises to jump in into the 
e-commerce transactions in order to give them more confidence for the small mid enterprises to go digital as the government uh, encourages us time so that they are able to quickly recover from the economic crisis because of the COVID-19. So that is that this is the problems that I have identified in the supervisions of partnership agreement in Indonesia and the solutions that I'm able to provide for the KPPU and also for the Indonesian competition authorities in Indonesia to support the small medium enterprises to quickly recover from the economic crisis in Indonesia in order to uh, revitalize the Indonesian economy in the future. Thank you for your attentions and give for your uh, comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Padian. Now we are uh, entering uh, into the second session of today's web webinar, uh, which is Q&A. And it looks like we have a few questions here. And this question is actually addressed to... The first question is from Georgina Shelby. And it's, uh, her question is for Prof. Hartini. Uh, Prof. Prof. Uh, Georgina uh, asked if the pandemic lasted longer more than it has already predicted. Would you think that the lockdown is effective? Because as we know that the world economy right now are very unstable and still uh, and does it still have full both towards the economy and the health of all the people. As we have seen uh, right now, it, either essential business and non-essential can't work maximally because of the pandemic. Uh, would you kindly uh, respond to that, Prof? Thank you, Dr. Fajal. Uh, thank you, Georgina. Um, I really like your question. And I think the Malaysian government agrees with you too. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, um, Malaysia currently now we are at MCO 3.0. So we have had two previous MCOs before, MCO 1.0 and 2.0. Now, um, interestingly, uh, when the government started MCO 2.0, it does not or it did not have the same effect as MCO 1.0. In a sense of, in a sense that uh, some of the sectors, uh, particularly uh, business sectors, uh, are allowed to operate, and in um, most of the communications to the public at large, the government has actually um, highlights the fact that uh, maintaining or, or or to strike a balance, striking a balance between health and livelihood is. Um, what we are aiming for at the moment. So of course there are pros and cons, you know, the fact that uh, our second MCO or even the third MCO were not or are not as strict as the first MCO. So to flatten the curve may actually take longer time. And we are experiencing that now, not that, you know, to flatten the, the curve, the, the fact that the numbers are rising is actually pretty scary. Um, but um, they have to uh, trust in this uh, system uh, because of the fact that there are other um, needs uh, that we have to think of. And, and one of the important needs that we have to think of is the livelihood, the impact on the economy. And uh, from the Malaysian experience, uh, if we um, implement the level of strictness as the first MCO, the, uh, our economy would be losing 2.4 billion per day. 
And I think, you know, we just can't afford. And, and more importantly, we are talking about the withering of uh, small traders, um, SMEs, um, uh, small business operators, they are going to wipe out. So I think in order to balance between the uh, need of flattening the curve and, and regain our health and, bat and, and battle battling against the uh, virus, we have to also be mindful of the economic impact, which I have also uh, mentioned so many times when the economy is impacted, it will have a spillover on the society. So um, overall, I think the Malaysian government has uh, taken a different approach in our MCO 2.0 and 3.0 in order to make sure that despite the restriction of movements, uh, the economy uh, could still be climbing up and taking off. And uh, we hope with uh, the uh, announcement and, and, and uh, announcement of uh, various uh, economy uh, stimulus packages, it would actually help um, our economy to climb back again and to, re, uh, to rebound again and, and to save um, our economy, particularly our small uh, businesses and traders. That's my response, Dr. Faja. I really hope uh, that response um, answers your question, Georgina. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. And I would like to relate this question to Prof. Ponchai. Would you like to share your views on this, Prof? Uh, uh, is the lockdown uh, effective? And from your from your academic standings, do you think the government will somehow uh, one day will make some new policy that actually uh, suits to uh, uh, to uh, for the economy and for the public. Yeah, doc, thank you, Dr. Faja. Let me share. It. Um, the lockdown seemed to have the effectiveness during the short terms. In Thailand, we have the lockdown 14 days. Everything stopped. However, after, after the lockdown, it's come up again. So I think it's, it's this, this situation that government have to balance between um, to maintain the number of patents and not to make um, any more effect to the economies. However, in Thailand, even the government issue any lockdowns now, um, it seems that uh, the people doesn't consider the lockdown as an effective mechanism. People still, I mean, because it's, it's, it's different from the other countries. Um, now, it's currently, some of the people, they don't believe in what government say. And even the government say it is, has to be lockdowns. But there is no um, incentive or any any uh, uh, payment or any any help to them. So the people choose not to follow the lockdown. So even the government issue the lockdown is still not be lockdown. So um, there is some at the point that the board of medical doctors asks the government to to lockdowns. However, the lockdown policy and mechanism doesn't make any helps to the situation. So this is the situation in Thailand, and I think it would happen to the other country where the government is not, I mean, believable, or they are not be even, I mean, accountable for what they make a policy. So this is the situation in Thailand. Um, just to share to you, the government won announced that they will open the country by within 120 days from June, in June. And they expect to open the country in October because the corporates asked to set up the policy to open the countries. But with the increase of 10,000 patents per day, I think it will not be easy to come back on to recover the economies by that sense. Even we have the Phuket models, Do you know the Phuket. And the government said that we have the island, the Phuket Islands, everyone knows in Thailand. It's the, the, the island that's separate from the Thailand. But the Phuket model doesn't, doesn't work because um, tourists will not come to Thailand in the short term because we have 10,000. So this is kind of limbo situation that government have to follow and have to deal. But I think most important thing is the life of people during this time, 
not the economic. Economic, we can make up within 10, 10 years, for example, but the life of people we have to save first. This is my view. Uh, Dr. Fajar, if I may add, yes. I think, you know, um, based on our experience as well, uh, there are two things uh, that um, um, I think needs to be uh, highlighted here. Number one, I think it's time for us to really um, have a very strong um, awareness on this. So self-awareness, self-lockdown, I think we have that campaign in Malaysia. I'm sure, you know, uh, in other jurisdictions too. Um, and perhaps, you know, that would actually neutralize and balance up uh, between like uh, what uh, Prof. Ponchai said just now. No matter, you know, how strict the lockdown is, if uh, the public uh, do not hear and adhere to it, you know, it will definitely go back to square one. So I think self regulation, we self regulate ourselves is very important. And just let's hope that the rate of immunization process could be accelerated, and we would manage to achieve this herd immunity in no time. And I think that's, you know, that would be um, our maybe one of the solutions to this. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Totally uh, if yes, I may Pak. jump in and intervene here. Certainly, Pak. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, many studies actually already show that the, uh, the um, containment measure has uh, been less effective uh, uh, during the, the, the new wave of uh, COVID, especially uh, in the uh, early 2021 uh, and also the, uh, the, the recent one. Um, in... Uh, I myself am currently conducting a study to look at the mobility, uh, the effect of mobility, uh, mobility restriction, and uh, and the uh, the uh, cases. And then uh, my uh, our prelim preliminary finding is that the data shows that. Uh, it becomes less effective and the effectiveness has been declining so far. Um, but uh, in my opinion, the containment measures, including lockdown, uh, still, uh, still uh, provide benefit to us, especially for buying time. For buying time uh, in order to prepare better health facilities first, and of course, to increase the vaccination coverage. Like in Malaysia, for example, during the last uh, the last months, uh, vaccination coverage has been uh, increasing for uh, more than 12, uh, 12 uh, around 12 to 13 percent. Uh, and, uh, and the lockdown basically uh, uh, helped in uh, containing the measures while the vaccination takes place. Uh, I, but of course, it means that uh, you should be able to take advantage of this window, uh, and you cannot just uh, you cannot just prolong the uh, the the measures, the containment measures, because uh, as I mentioned in my my uh, pr uh, presentations, the cost to the economy is also get, getting bigger, while the effectiveness of the containment measure is declining. So uh, 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 in my opinions, what we need to see, what we need to do is to uh, take advantage of this buying time period, the window of opportunity. Speaking of uh, vaccination programs, Pak Yose, uh, there's a, actually a second question. Uh, it's for you, Pak. Uh, the point is uh, until when we, we can always rely on, on the vaccine programs. There will be always new variants, new types of uh, new types of uh, COVID. Maybe in in relation to the uh, economic recovery, would you like to expand or elaborate on that? Uh, I'm not a health expert, uh, but uh, well, uh, I I um, I'm quite. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm quite familiar with data reading uh, and data pattern, uh, and then what I see from the data so far, from the statistics so far, is that the vaccinations do not really uh, prevent us from getting infected, but rather uh, it uh, reduces significantly the fatality rate. That's what uh, you can uh, you can see from the case of the UK, for example, where the the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
uh, currently the next uh, wave uh, uh, has been coming uh, for uh, at least one month, but the fatality rate remains to be very low. Uh, it also happens in many other countries with high vaccinations, such as in Israel and uh, Chile. So the the, the vaccinations, uh, in my opinion, can uh, would be able to uh, uh, would allow us to shift our attention from the first uh, uh, best uh, solutions uh, uh, containing the spread of the pandemic, containing the spread of the disease, to the second best solution reducing the fatality rate. Right. So perhaps more, more, uh, many governments uh, also should change their target now. Now it's no longer time to help the, help the spread or uh, stop the, uh, the spread of the, the, spread of the uh, COVID pandemic, but rather to reduce the pa- uh, fatality rate. Uh, so, uh, uh, because because we're, we're entering a new normal here. We're, it's, uh, uh, it's unreasonable if we expect that we no longer have a COVID-19 uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the few few next years. Uh, we have to live with the, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, as, as we have to live with uh, many other uh, diseases, but we can control the spread uh, and also we can control the fatality rate. Uh, that's the most important thing. And the vaccination, uh, uh, in my opinion, is uh, really the key uh, to achieve that target. Uh, and one of the, uh, uh, I, I mentioned also in my presentations, one important point is to have data transparency and data sharing in the production and also uh, the uh, uh, efficacy and the effectiveness of the vaccine. Because it would be useful in order to re, uh, to review the the uh, vaccine uh, uh, and to uh, come up perhaps with some modifications on the uh, vaccination that is more effective uh, in uh, fi- uh, in fighting new variants of COVID nineteen. Right. Thank you, Payose, and I hope these uh, answers. Uh, 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 may answer Georgina's and Sarah Irawan's question and allow me to move on to our uh, third question it's uh, from Andres and uh, he actually uh, addressed this question uh, to Prof Hartini and to Rachel uh, regarding geopolitical tensions during the COVID-19 pandemic in your views and uh, and your opinion. Does literacy in geopolitical tensions become a challenge for countries in the ASEAN region, such as collaboration in regional arrangements or others to accelerate economic recovery? Uh, Rachel, would you like to uh, share your views on that? Sure, thank you, Fajar. Um, Perhaps I might deal with my area of expertise, which is uh, a little more confined than geopolitical tensions generally in ASEAN, um, and focus just on um, cooperation between the competition agencies in ASEAN, um, because this is going to be uh, a very important uh, aspect of uh, the ongoing economic growth in the region. Um, we know from experience in other regions around the world, you know, those sort of economic regions result in cross-border cartel activity and cross-border merger activity. Um, And in the context of COVID, uh, we've already seen the um, unification, if you like, of the competition agencies in the region and coming out jointly and making a statement about how competition agencies are going to deal with these issues in the region. Um, So I think... um, the uh, over the last five years, uh, I've been working um, with the ASEAN agencies on regional cooperation, and I think uh, in that five-year period, the agencies have come a tremendous distance. Um, you know, from being initially a little bit hesitant, not understanding each other's laws, not understanding what other uh, powers they had to now being in a place where there's a lot of cooperation potential between the competition agencies. Um, For those of you who are less familiar with this area, um, I mentioned before the AEGC, the ASEAN Experts Group on Competition, 
that comprises representatives from all of the competition authorities. Um, they, they have um, signed a regional cooperation framework under which those agencies um, agree that they will cooperate under certain circumstances and share information under certain circumstances, all voluntarily. There's no obligation involved. Um, and more recently, um, the uh, establishment um, of the ASEAN Competition Enforcers Network, ASEAN they call it. Um, so these steps have really enhanced the ability of the agencies in the region to cooperate. Um, in relation to cross-border cartels or cross-border mergers. And, and I think um, the uh, statements already made about COVID and COVID recovery and the importance of competition law that have been made jointly will be really important coming out of COVID, as will a joint effort in um, addressing any anti-competitive anti -competitive, anti behaviour, not only that crosses borders, but we might see mirror issues in jurisdictions you know one a juris, an issue in indonesia may well crop up not in a cross border context but in another jurisdiction within um, the asean region so i know that doesn't answer the geopolitical question um, but hopefully that gives you some insight into the the um, potential for cooperation amongst the competition authorities um, so I, I suspect um, hatini might be better placed to deal with the geopolitical issues i'll hand to you hatini okay Thank you, Richard. Prof. Hartini, be, uh, Abir, uh, let me ask uh, Pak Dian. Pak, uh, do you think KPU should uh, consider another aspect of this geopolitical tensions thing uh, for the uh, supervision of the uh, agreement? Do you do you do you think for KPU in order to accelerate? Uh, the economic recovery should uh, consider this thing. Uh, thank you, Papa Jar. From my point of view, the original intentions of the KPPU is the, as the hand or as the agent of a regulatory intervention in the market. Right. So, based on the Article 33 of Indonesian Constitutions, it, it is very stated that the, that the state must the regulate the economic sectors which are vital for people. Right. And the implementations of this Article 33 is the establishment of KPPU as the regulatory instrument, regulatory intervention uh, agency. So based on that, the KPPU must uh, strict to the uh, mandate of the Article 33 to ensure the principle of economic democracy in Indonesia. Right. So by saying that, uh, KPPU has lots of things, yeah, Pak? Lots of things to do. Many yeah. things to consider. Can I? Yes? Can I, can I jump in a little bit? Um, yeah, just so talking far. about the geopolitical system in ASEAN, because I teach ASEAN law as well, it seems to be consensus-based, so we cannot force any person to do. That's the point that it's not easy for cooperation mm. For example, mm. if you come to Thailand and Myanmar, we have the border, and Myanmar is now military, and Thailand is semi-military. That's the issue. How can we deal with that? And also, I mean, to tell you the story, for example, Indonesia and, now, and Malaysia may condemn, for example, for example, this is just example, condemn the government in Myanmar about that political system. And then we have the pandemic all throughout the ASEAN. So that will be a little, not a little bit, but it's difficult to cooperate. However, with that issue, bigger than political issue is the COVID issue. I think we have to cooperate at that point. But of course, it's not that easy to cooperate in the ge geopolitical system within the ASEAN frameworks. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Now, uh, lastly, Prof. Uh, Hartini, would you like to... <laughs> To, thank you, uh, thank you, you uh, Andres, uh, for a very interesting question. Um, um, I'm not sure whether you know this would satisfy you know you, but um, from my point of view, um, I think the nature of ASEAN is uh, contributes to this uh, challenging factor, uh, as what Prof. Uh, Ponchai mentioned just now. 
uh, the fact that it's it's not binding. It's up to the political will of the respective jurisdiction to uh, emulate and to adopt any ASEAN initiatives. However, I think so far um, within the ASEAN regions and the ASEAN member states, we have had a very good understanding and the principle of uh, solidarity diplomacy uh, has been uh, um, uphold um, very well. And in time of COVID uh, in particular, I think we could actually see how uh, the ASEAN member states have actually come together, for example, to come up with a, a comprehensive framework. Some might say that, you know, it's, it's, it's just a piece of paper, but I thought that it's a good start. When we don't have any blueprint, you know, we don't really know where to go. And now we know that our problem is on the uh, political will and the willingness of uh, every member states to actually believe in that blueprint. I thought that that's a very good start. And speaking about geopolitical tensions, I think from a broader picture, uh, even though the tension is not within the ASEAN member states, um, the um, uh, external uh, geopolitical tensions uh, involving, you know, the uh, giants' jurisdictions, which to a certain extent um, um, give, you know, some pressure to the ASEAN member states. But I think ASEAN member states um, are brilliant. You know, they have made it clear that based on this solidarity diplomacy, we have to maintain our uh, centrality and we have to position ASEAN very well to act as a connector and we position ourselves um, um, uh, uh, as a connector, you know, uh, to uh, these uh, uh, geographical, uh, political, you know, um, uh, tension issues. And if we maintain that, I think we could actually sustain what we have. And even we could actually enter a new era where even though, and this is, this is going to be epic because we are unlike EU, it's, it's binding. Ours is not binding. And when somebody follows things that are not binding on you, I think it's a good sign of solidarity. So in the spirit of solidarity, let us just unite, not in name, but also in practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, for that's, uh, that's very thoughtful. Okay, uh, I hope this uh, answer your question, Pat uh, Now, before I wrap up to all speakers, is there anything else you wanted to cover? Then now it, it is time to make a very uh, brief Conclusion, Prof. Uh, Poncha highlighted the uh, the emergency decree on public administration in emergency situation. COVID-19 is also treated as communicable disease. To cope with uh, emergency situations, government possess, uh, possesses the power to handle and treat on uh, emergency situations, especially in COVID-19. Such powers are mandated to provincial mayor and committee, committee to manage situations. To treat this emergency, Prime Minister orders a lockdown in specific areas. Travel bans for crossing provinces, close all potential businesses uh, that uh, cause the spread of COVID-19. It is uh, interesting that how uh, ad hoc Committee under Prime Minister and other professional obliged to make a statistic collection and report to the public. Prof. Uh, Ponchai also highlighted that the government uh, mismanagement, such as information on vaccine and agreement of vaccine, no choices of vaccine, delay of queues of vaccine, no effective centralized policy on uh, managing uh, vaccine. He uh, also shared the uh, very latest uh, laws that uh, the government has announced a ban on gatherings throughout the country, especially in Bangkok. And gathering and formation of group consists of more than five people violating uh, the terms of uh, violating it. Uh, it backed by sanctions. And then the second speaker, right? Rachel has highlighted and reintroduced the relevance of competition law and policy 
it is uh, to have a standing to know the policy objectives in ASEAN member states, namely economic growth, uh, consumer welfare, economic efficiency, and promotion of competition. She emph uh, emphasized on the uh, interconnection between COVID-19 and competition law, especially on panic buying. The solutions may not appear directly relevant to medium small enterprises, but they preserve a uh, competitive market. She uh, explained and gave examples on panic buying, such as uh, crisis cartels and many more. This is how all players react in the market. She uh, underlined policy res responses, especially on the importance of competition law. And competition law continues to play a fundamental role in the economy. Fair competition in an economy will enhance economic efficiency, stimulate innovation and economic growth, and increase consumer welfare. This will greatly contribute to the region's effort in overcoming the pandemic's uh, adverse impact. Next, Prof. Uh, Hartini shared Malaysian experience how COVID-19 impacted to most areas, disrupted trades and business, yeah. and, and all movement and travels are limited and restricted. Most uh, ASEAN member states rely heavily on tourism and hospitality sectors. And this COVID-19 uh, totally impacted the country's uh, common factor is business uh, closures and retrenchment. She uh, also pointed out that ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and it, uh, it shows ASEAN response and stages. And there's an, informat there's a, there's an informative slide where Prof. Hartini show, showed ASEAN strat strategies for recovery by proactive approach, flexible. And she, uh, she later on shared Malaysian experiences in responding COVID, uh, starting numbers on infected ca cases, death cases, and national immunization programs, and also on how government committed to accelerate vaccination programs, and Malaysian economy also impacted significantly. We are facing the third period and the third lockdown. And, and uh, Prof. Hartini also delivered issues and challenges toward this. Some of them are the drastic uh, decline in economic ac activities, food insecurity, limited employment opportunity, and up to limitation in the logistic sectors. Most of them are quite common, yeah, Prof, with uh, Indonesia. And but Jose shared a very, very informa uh, informative and detailed on current situations, data, data, and data, especially on fatality rate and reasons on why vaccination, like as we discussed it before, is the key for better situation because most countries are still below world average. Many has difficulties in securing the supply, and it is clear enough that COVID-19 in uh, uh, in economy disrupted in all aspects, flow of people, goods, money, and flow of information. And again, he showed a data that show trade measures implemented in response to pandemic. The data is actually calculated from IPC's COVID-19 trade measures. And another data also showed uh, people mobility still not recovered. The COVID-19 pandemic hit tourism in Asia deeply. And also that is why he believed that it may take years to recover, but some ex actions might uh, accelerate the adjustment. Critical issues in dealing with pandemic uh, and crisis, they are uh, short, medium, and long terms. Uh, some of them in uh, short term, vaccine production and, dis and distribution, and uh, in medium term, supporting uh, exit strategy, and for the long term, issues uh, such as putting more resources to towards the realization of SDGs. And 
And pa Yose also concluded that the pandemic is not over in South Asia. Instead, it is peaking. And later on, he uh, mentioned for the very last time, ASEAN and other countries in the region are central in promoting uh, uh, such transformation to uh, for the uh, economic recovery. And finally, Pak Dian <coughs> uh, presented uh, first how COVID-19 impacted Indonesian, Indonesian micro, small, medium enterprises. This included the impact on Indonesia competition law, the existence of KPPU is to supervise partnership agreement to enhance the economic activities of micro, small, medium enterprises. He also showed the frameworks on prohibition of substances in the partnership agreement between uh, micro, small, medium enterprises and large companies. With the authority of KPTU, such provision shall be done in an orderly and regular manner in order to stabilize economic activities that benefit community at large. And Pak Dian also concluded that, that uh, there's uh, three issues that should be uh, should be solved in the near future for KPPU. The first one is vacuum of regulations regarding big data. And the second one is there is no clear regulations on how uh, to assess market power. And uh, third one, there is no clear regulations to prevent any abuse of big company against micro, small, medium enterprises. I think we are good for now. Thank you, everyone. And it was a pleasure being with you all today. Finally, we have uh, come to the end of our webinar. And I would like to thank everyone who made this event possible. And I thank Prof. Ponchai, Rachel Burgess, Prof. Hartini, Payo Serizal Damuri PhD, and Dr. Dian for their outstanding presentations. Indeed, they are useful for our uh, future legal studies. And I, I feel privileged to extend my warm appreciation to all presented here. Thank you all once again for coming, and we will definitely see you again next time. Be well all. God bless you. Moderator, over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Fajr Sugianto and all of our speakers for the materials and information that was given to us. We hope that it will be beneficial for us in the future. Before we end our webinar, uh, we would like to give our speakers as a gratitude uh, in the form of certificate uh, for allocating their time and uh, mind uh, to contribute to this webinar. Uh, the certificate will be given by Associate Professor Dr. Agus Budianto as Head of Committee and will be received symbolically by Associate Professor Dr. Ponchai Witusak. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I will be taking the screenshot. Uh, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, now I invite all of the speakers to proceed to the photo session. Uh, if uh, you may, please be ready. Okay, one, two, three. Thank, thank you. Uh, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to take you to take another look of the video provided by our sponsors. Lawyer itu profesi yang saya inginkan dari sejak sekolah. Lawyer itu identik dengan smart person. Lawyering can be fun, sibuk, 
tapi tetap bisa meluangkan waktu untuk keluarga dan teman. Semua tergantung bagaimana kita memanajenya. Pekerjaan yang kompleks dituntut untuk selalu sharp dalam berpikir dan menganalisa serta memberikan solusi bagi setiap permasalahan klien kita. Tidak ada namanya waktu libur, klien selalu menjadi prioritas. Tetapi ketika kita menikmati apa yang kita kerjakan, semuanya tidak terasa berat. Saya Hendra Ong, saya partner di Dentons HPRP. My name is Timothy Kiriwang. I'm a litigator and I practice international trade. I graduated from UPH in 2007, practice law in Hanafia Pongawa and Partners. During my life as a lawyer, I've encountered many problems, many mistakes, but what I learned in UPH is always to get back up and do it again. So in life, I always look to the future and I learn from my past. Hi, saya Dea Tungga ST. Saya alumni UPH tahun 2000 dan lulus tahun 2004. Sekarang profesi saya sebagai lawyer dan sebagai dosen. Kok suruh milih yang mana ya yang lebih menyenangkan di antara keduanya? Well, I love them both. Dua-duanya membuat saya terus update sama keadaan-keadaan yang ada di masyarakat. Tentunya dengan ilmu hukum yang terus berkembang secara dinamis. Buat saya, semua hal itu mungkin. Tinggal kemauan diri kita sendiri. Kalau kita percaya kita bisa, pasti semuanya bakal kita dapat. Okay, uh, since we started our webinar with a prayer, it would be appropriate if we end our webinar with a prayer also. The closing prayer will be led by Ms. Yosi Niken Raspati, SHMH. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to lead us in prayer. Prayer will be done accordingly to Christian faith. Participant with others belief or religion may pray respectively. Dear God, as this webinar comes to an end, we thank you for your grace upon all the things you have done today, for the time you have given us for the chance to acquire different knowledge from our speakers throughout this webinar. Help us to carry this fruitful knowledge and experiences to produce wonderful things of beauty and great blessing to many. May you bless each and everyone who took time to gather here today and let your hand of protection be upon them throughout the rest of the week. For yours in the kingdom, the power and the glory in this age and forevermore. Amen. Okay, thank you, Miss Yossi. And that marks the end of our webinar. Once again, we would like to thank all the speakers, all the participants, and committee that attended this webinar. And thank you to all the sponsors that made this webinar possible. Our gold sponsors, Lipo Group, Dentons HPRP, Tandra and Associates, and also our silver sponsors, Tungga Ramli and Partners, Fanny Adelina Makeup Artists, Pinter Politik, Walalangi and Partners, Dewi Jala and Partners, and also Kairani Mohkair and Partners. We really hope that we can learn something from this webinar. We as your MC apologize if there are any misbehavior or any words that are offensive. I am Dito, and on behalf of my partner Caca, 